I wanted to um, welcome everybody, uh, Marino School, faculty, students, staff, parents, and honored guests. My name is Mr. Chang, and I'm the eighth grade science teacher. Today's Science Expo is about celebrating the learning that has gone on in our classrooms. While our course is based on life sciences, we have covered robotics, design, and introductory medical sciences this school year. When our students were asked to come up with a specific field to research, many of them struggled to find something that they would devote weeks to researching. What you see today is a culmination of their efforts. It was our goals as eighth grade teachers to give them a little bit of technical writing, a little bit of research, a little bit of citing their sources, and a taste of presenting their findings with poise to a larger audience. This also provides us with an exciting connection in preparation for our programs in our high school division. In a few short months, our eighth, eighth graders will be introduced to our Pathways program at Marino High School. These pathways include medical innovation, STEM, CAP and aerospace, creative arts and expression, and advanced learning. Today, we are proud of our students and their devotion to the sciences, hoping that this generation of learners will have a will have unique solutions to our world's problems and solutions to problems that don't yet exist. Without further ado, I welcome you to this year's Science Expo. Hi, my name is Lyric Adams, and I'm here with my partner, Kara Sue. And today we'll be talking to you about hydroponic lettuce growing experiment. The hydroponic planting system is planting crops without using soil and relies on water. The word hydro means water, while ponics is a growing system. This encourages better growth and quality in plants. Since the world's population is increasing, food security becomes one of the main topics in the world. It makes it hard to grow crops due to the drop of fertile soil. Lastly, with climate changes such as droughts, the dependency of water being available is uncertain. So why we chose lettuce as our final plant to grow? As we first started our research of hydroponics, we wanted to be able to see what sorts of fruits or vegetables would be best to grow for our project, especially with the limited time we had for it. So with the help of the study of hydroponic growing by St. Lauren in 2019, it mentions that romaine lettuce matures to around a month or two and can easily be germinated so they can be transferred into a hydroponic system, which is why we chose that as our final thing to grow. So the materials we use for a hydroponic plant system. So we first used a wet paper towel, a bowl, cotton balls, and a mist sprayer. But the cotton balls and mist sprayer are optional but for the cotton balls, it's kind of recommended because it absorbs a lot of water. So you don't need to check on the plant and water it as much as you used to because it sort of like soaks up the water already. And for the mist sprayer, I mean, you can use anything for to water your plant, but this is what we use and that worked best for our plant. So here are my results. As you can see, starting from week one to week three, my plant grew steadily and fast. So as seen in my picture, my plant grew a lot slower compared to Kara's plant and my plant growing was inconsistent and I didn't do well with watering it and as well as measuring the amount of sunlight it took in, which is why it grew like that. Here's a bar graph to show the comparison between mines and lyric. You can see there are four childs in all starting from the first few days and then the average in centimeters. So our hypothesis is if we perform this experiment on a hydroponic system, it will grow in success successfully and in good health and the control is sunlight and temperature indoors. And the independent variable are the var variables that the experiment changes to test their dependent variable. So in our case, that independent variable was the lettuce growing hydroponically, and the dependent variable was the length of the plant's roots after three weeks. With limited space in soil, it's hard to maintain a crops out in the open. With this system, it can provide you with plants that can benefit us all, since it takes up 90% less water, and is easy to control the temperature or sunlight. So our next step into this project is to persuade farmers into using this method because it can help them practice living in a better environment. Do you guys have any questions? So excellent job uh, from our audience. Is there are there any questions for our first presenters, uh, Lyric and Kara? So I, I mean, I think I have a question. My question would be to either of you. Um, when you were looking at something to pursue, why did you go with hydroponics as opposed to any of, of the other types of farming? Well, we were, we were both really interested in plants and we wanted to like find a way to grow without using soil because sometimes soil can be scarce. So we decided to use this method because it's easy to grow and it's better to control. Okay, great job. Thank you, ladies. I uh, appreciate all the hard work that went into it. Uh, we're gonna now transition over to our next presenter. Welcome everyone. I hope you're having a great morning. My 
a show of hands, how many of you guys are pet owners? This is Decoding Animal Language and Interaction by Joy Su and Madison Ito. We chose this topic not only because of how fascinating animals are, but how wonderful would it be to be able to communicate with your pets. My partner and I love to volunteer at the Hawaiian Humane Society and other nonprofit organizations, so this was a topic that really piqued our interest. Decoding animal language will enable animal lovers to be able to interpret what their pets are saying and make communication a lot more effective. Who wouldn't want to be able to talk to their pets? We hope you enjoy our presentation. Did you know that animals can communicate through pheromones? They are sometimes known as a behavior altering agent that can raise alarms, strengthen the bond between mother and their offspring, or even warn other animals to back off. They sound like high pitched chirps or barking, hissing, purring, growling, and so much more. These pheromones are powerful messages that are universally understood across different species. This universal language is compelling and fascinating. Lastly, gestures such as facial expressions, body language, and posturing are also effective ways of communication. Each way communicates without the means of grammar or structure. These graphs show the data that we collected. The first graph to the far left shows the results of an experiment where three women of the same size and similar appearance, each wearing a different color shirt, walk through a colony of prairie dogs. The lines show different calls of sound waves and reflections. The results for the blue and yellow shirt calls were quite different, while the green shirt did not show significant difference. The graph in the middle shows how animals of various sizes and various species react to distinct levels of frequencies or sounds. And finally, the last graph shows that dogs have around the same hearing sensitivity, but much better hearing compared to humans. In conclusion, we discovered that AI technology is currently being used to decode animal language and to greater understand animal communication. Mobile technology is also being used to interpret animal language and enable humans to communicate with creatures they love. The Wild Dolphin Project uses similar algorithms using underwater keyboards and computers to decode the dolphin language. This enabled researchers to both communicate with dolphins and understand what they're trying to express. Next steps. Researchers will establish an app to translate when an animal is trying to communicate to its owner. This will be much like Google Translate. This app will foster effective communication between owner and pet, thereby enriching and nurturing their bond. This makes for a happy pet and an even happier pet owner. These are our citations we found. Thank you for listening. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, in the future, what other potential uses would you um, would you see this helpful with? Well, let me check it. I'll give you a call back, okay? Can you think of any? Okay. Yeah. Uh, communicating with pets, like if a pet's sick, maybe they could communicate to their owner and they could get the help that they need. Yeah. Or like, you know, when you have a pet and something's wrong with them but like it's not like you can talk to them maybe you can ask them and then give them medicine or maybe they're hungry it'll make communication a lot more easier thank you any other questions thank you for your time we hope you have a fantastic day and enjoy the rest of the presentations Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, for our sixth graders that have just joined us, please make sure that your uh, microphones are on mute um, and that you are listening to our presentations. This uh, meeting is being recorded just as a gentle reminder. Hi, my name is Mia. I'm a student in AA, and today I'm going to be presenting simulations of anti-gravity. Now, you may be asking, why anti-gravity? Well, space has always interested me from a young age. I enjoyed learning about the solar system but I soon enjoyed learning about zero gravity. I wanted to find a way to create or simulate anti-gravity to speed up the process of construction. Every so often, I see a new building being built near my orthodontist's office. Buildings can be constructed very quickly depending on the size and area that it is in. I wanted to find a way to help workers build more efficiently and quickly. However, upon learning that anti-gravity could not be achieved, I decided I want to find ways to simulate it. The future of anti-gravity. Anti-gravity, or at least simulations of anti-gravity, could revolutionize the process of construction and repair. Buildings could be assembled swiftly and safely. Cars could be repaired with ease and with very little effort. Although first, we need to understand gravity. What is gravity? 
Gravity is an invisible force that attracts objects towards Earth. The more mass an object has, the greater the gravity. Objects fall at W equals mgh, W for weight, M for mass, and H for height. The weight matters, and so does the amount of mass and the height that it is falling from. Gravity is ubiquitous, meaning that it can be found everywhere, just in different quantities. In fact, even space contains gravity. The planets and stars are all held up by gravity from the sun. Now, what is anti-gravity? Anti-gravity is a hypothetical phenomenon, meaning it is a proposed explanation of a phenomenon. Anti-gravity is also known as zero gravity, both meaning an object or area that is free from gravity. And this leads me to my first experiment. Tensegrity. Tensegrity is a tensile structure. It contains compression elements and tensile elements. As you can see, the popsicle sticks are the compression elements because they are compressed by the tensile elements. The strings are the tensile elements. Tensegrities are equilibrated structures. The balance of compression forces to tensile forces balances and stabilizes the structure, therefore simulating anti-gravity. The next experiment that simulates anti-gravity is magnetism. Magnetism is the movement of electrical charges. Those charges can be either positive or negative. Magnets contain poles, north and south. Poles that are the same will attract. Poles that are the opposite will repel each other. Magnetic globes use this concept. There are two ends to this pedestal, and each end contains a magnet turned to a pole. Then, inside the globe, the globe contains two magnets located at the north and south poles on the globe. By placing the globe in between the pedestal, the magnets will repel each other because the magnets in the globes are the opposite poles of the ones in the pedestal. This repelling simulates anti-gravity. The last experiment I will be talking about is the zero G. The zero G is a plane that flies in parabolic arches. The plane will start at the pre-parabola, which contains the normal amount of gravity on Earth. It will then move to the pull-up, which contains 1.8 G, which is also known as microgravity. The plane will then enter the uppermost of the parabola, which is zero G, or zero gravity. During zero G, passengers will be able to experience a state of zero gravity. After reaching zero G, the plane will then descend to the pullout, which contains 1.8 G, then to the post parabola, which contains the normal amount of gravity on Earth. And these are my citations. Now, all these experiments can be done, some at home and others elsewhere. But nevertheless, even though anti gravity cannot be achieved, it can be simulated. And this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Audience, audience, are there any questions for Mia? If not, I have a question for her. Uh, you can either show your hand, uh, raise your hand if you have a question for her. Hi, Mr. Chan, it's Dr. Go ahead, Lexi, has a, Lexi has a question in the um, learning com the learning room. Okay, did you want to just ask it, Doc? I will. So the question is, how can this be used in the future? And what is the importance? Anti-gravity or simulations of anti-gravity can be used to speed up the process of construction. So for example, cars, <clears throat> when they're repaired, you have a board and then the repairman will need to lay on the board and go underneath the car. That can be very difficult, especially when you either forget your tool or you get stuck. So we don't. But using an anti-gravity field or anti-gravity, you can, I say, make the make the car levitate, and repairing it will be very easy or easier. And I know we have uh, Dr. Tolentino, uh, who had just said that that was her question too. She is the, one of the instructors over at the high school level. Uh, Dr. Tolentino, did you have any other questions or did Mia answer it for you? Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, Mia. Uh, we're gonna be uh, with our next presenter, uh, Jacob Romano and Jason Lau. Uh, good morning, everyone. Our names are Jacob and Jason. Our research is based around de-extinction. Uh, my partner and I wanted to see if de-extinction is possible. Now, what is de-extinction? Uh, de-extinction is the idea of bringing back an extinct animal back to life. For example, if you wanted to bring back the mammoth, you would have to de-extinct it. This is important to us because if de-extinction were possible, we could, po we could possibly see certain animals live with us. This would also be an achievement if done properly. Uh, why we chose this topic? Um, we wanted to research this topic because we wanted to, first of all, see if it was even possible. And if it was, we wanted to see how soon we will be seeing extinct animals roam the earth again. Oh, you may be asking, 
what is the extinction? The extinction is a process of bringing back certain species that have gone extinct. Some examples of extinct animals would be the dodo, the woolly mammoth, or the passenger pigeon. So what is needed for the extinction to work? Um, the DNA from the animal you're trying to de-extinct and molecular bioengineering Is the extinction possible? Um, the extinction is possible, but not to its full potential. What I mean by that is that in 2003, European scientists brought back an extinct species of mountain goat, um, but sadly it only lasted for 58 seconds. This also shows that we are not fully able to de extinct the species yet to its full ability. This is one of the tables we found on the, on the internet from Ben Jacob Novak in 2018 showing the possible species that are trying to be brought back and the methods that are being used. Um, this graph is also from Ben Jacob Novak in 2018, showing the process of de-extinction using the method uh, hybridization. Um, based off what we researched, de-extinction is very much possible. However, as of now, we can't fully bring back an animal yet. There are also many methods to the extinction that major companies are trying to master. For our next step, we would like to introduce this idea to major companies. This could blow up and be a major hit. Soon, we could have zoos dedicated to animals that were once extinct. Citations. Uh, thank you for listening. Any questions? Mr. Chang, it's Doc. I have a question. Go ahead, Doc. Um, I'm just wondering if we should think about not can we, but should we bring back these types of creatures and animals? And I'm just wondering what uh, the presenter's perspective is. Not can we, but should we from a moral or ethical uh, perspective? Thanks. Oh, oh. Um, it kind of depends because there's um, consequences that may happen, but it depends on the animal you're trying to bring back. Uh, any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. I think it's just a fascinating kind of field to think about. I mean, we have popularized movies like Jurassic Park, you know, that they try to bring back animals, um, but also in the, in the fact of just maintaining animals, um, just fascinating. Thank you very much for your hard work on that. Uh, up next, we have Hayden Agbayani. Hello, my name is Hayden Agbayani. I am a student in 8B, and I'll be presenting to you about what drink makes teeth rot faster. Now, the reason why I did this project was because it tested my problems, um, my problem solving skills. I didn't have any human teeth laying around, so I had to use eggs since eggs have the same calcium that teeth contain. Another, another reason why I did this project was because I plan on working in the medical field when I grow up. And since dentists make a lot of money, I figured to do a project involving teeth. Yeah, okay. Um, they are caused when you have bacteria in your mouth, frequently snack on sugary drinks, and not cleaning your teeth well. Cavities are everywhere, being one of the most common health problems in the world. Today, tooth decay are um, tooth decay are most likely to be found in children, teenagers, and older adults. But however, they can have they can happen to anyone who has teeth, including infants. They can get larger and affect deeper layers of the tooth if they are not treated. Cavities can eventually lead to toothaches, infections, and tooth loss. Major findings. The graph on the top left are the eggs before it went through the process, and the graph on the bottom right are the eggs after it went through the process. On the table on the left, it shows how the eggs look like before the procedure. And on the table on the right, it shows how the eggs look like after the procedure, showing the damage after seven days. As shown, orange juice rots the teeth the fastest, completely eroding some parts of the shell and producing many cracks. Families can use this information to teach their kids what soft drinks to avoid in order to have healthy teeth. As dentistry being very expensive and is a necessity for good oral health, it is very important for kids to have the healthiest teeth possible. After all, having good teeth is a good way to present yourself. Conclusion, 
So in conclusion, according to the data found in this experiment, orange juice rots teeth the fastest out of the four drinks. This is because there is both sugar and acid in orange juice. For that reason, when oral bacteria comes into contact with sugar, the bacteria consumes it, creating an acid which essentially attacks the tooth enamel. As time goes on, the acidic attacks demineralize the teeth, creating cavities. These are my citations, and are there any questions? I know I had a question, uh, Hayden, uh, unless anybody else has a question. I know that you shared with me uh, via your paper some of the errors that went on. Can you talk to me um, about all the different errors and the, the several other times that you team chatted me about what to do next? All right. So um, when I began the project, uh, I actually um, was at, I had a, like a dilemma in which I should boil the eggs or not because... Oh. Um, if I'm assuming that one of the crack or one of the eggs will crack, I, um, if the eggs weren't boiled, then the yolk would like spill out, and I don't think I want that to happen. So, I <laughs> I figured that I should just like boil the eggs. Um, another error was um, when when I left the eggs like inside the drinks for like seven days. Usually by like day two, there'd be like ants all over my desk and like the eggs. So it would like somehow like get in the 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 drink. So I wasn't actually completely sure that um the soft drinks were actually the ones that eroding or were at, was actually the one eroding the egg. It could actually be the ants, but I'm not too sure. Spectacular job. You know, we had talked so much about the um the errors behind different, you know, things that I think this, our students have always had the misconception that all experiments have to be run perfectly. And I think that your error one with the ants just kind of cracked me up. So uh, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Thank you for all your hard work. Uh, any other questions for Hayden? Hi, my name is Naz. Hi, my name is Hannah. We are students in 8B and today we'll be talking about the most common injuries in volleyball and basketball. We decided to research this topic because we are both interested in the medical field and we hope to become medical professionals in the future. Here's what I found about common basketball injuries. The game of basketball has changed over the years. It has changed from a game of finesse to a collision sport to a high risk contact sport. According to Chad Starkey, an athletic trainer at Northeastern University, completed profiles of experienced injuries in the NBA from the 1988 to the 1999 season. A total of 1,094 players appeared in the database 3,843 times. The demographics were average of 26 years old, four years average of NBA playing experience. Their average height was 200.8 centimeters and their average weight is 100 Point two kilograms. Ankle sprains were the most common reoccurring orthopedic injury. Other injuries are patellofemora inflammation, lumbar strains, and knee sprains. Patellofemoral inflammation is pain at the front of your knee, around your knee, also known as a patella. It is also known as runner's knee. And this injury is more common for people who participate in sports that involve jumping and running. Lumbar strains are injury to the lower back. This results in damaged tendons and muscles that can spasm and feel sore. Knee sprains is an acute injury in which tendons and ligaments become stretched or torn. Most strains occur because of direct blows to the knee, extreme bending or twisting of joints, or overuse of repetitive activity. Here are some of the interesting things I researched about volleyball. Men's volleyball has greatly changed. In 2017, it was considered the fifth most, most popular sport in the world. Many people who play the sport know the consequences that come with the joy of playing. According to a paper written by William W. Briner and Lawrence Kakmar in 2012, the most common injury in volleyball is related to blocking. Blocking in volleyball is very dangerous. If players get too close to the net, they can land on other players' feet, causing ankle sprains. Ankle sprains during a study conducted with 272 volleyball athletes were calculated to be 54% of the injury, injuries that occurred. 
Ankle sprains are not the only injury to think about, however. Patella tendonitis is the most common overuse injury or the overuse of a muscle or ligament. Patella tendonitis, more commonly known as jumper's knee, is the, is the inflammation of your patellar tendon that connects your kneecap to your shin bone. When inflamed, it can cause swelling and stiffness. Preventative measures for ankle sprains include wearing an ankle brace or foot orthosis to stabilize your posture or your foot to, minimi to minimize movement of the ankle, preventing severe trauma. Something to always practice if you are injured is rice. Rest, ice, compression, and elevation. This will greatly lessen recovery time and help the injury heal properly. Conclusion. Ankle sprains were the most frequent game-related injuries. The second most frequent injury was patellofemoral complex. This was the second most frequent site of orthopedic trauma. Overall, both volleyball and basketball have the same injuries in common. Next steps. In the future, to decrease the number of injuries, I hope that we can create better shoes to better stabilize our feet so that we don't sprain our ankles. We can use different materials and try different styles to create signif a significant difference and a strong relationship between the shoe type and ankle sprains. Another option would be to create ankle braces that are sturdy and comfortable. These braces should be able to withstand and limit the amount of stress on the ankle during an inversion or eversion of, an, of the ankle, causing minimal damage to major tendons, muscles, or ligaments. These are our citations. Thank you for watching. Did anyone have any questions for us? Hi, my name is Sean. I am an eighth grader in A B, and today I want to talk a little about cadences and olfactory response. I'll be going over an introduction to olfactory and its importance to canines, why I chose this topic, some of my major findings, and possible next steps. The olfactory system is in charge of detecting and interpreting scents found by the body, odorants or scents through the olfactory system into the olfactory bulb, an organ that connects the nose to the brain. The olfactory bulb then can inform or forewarn the brain with the results. Canines use their olfactory system to detect prey, find information about their surroundings, and identify other beings with age, gender, mood, health, diet, and much more. Whether wild or domesticated, dogs depend on their olfactory system to survive. I chose to research this project because canines and their nose have so much potential. With proper training, canines can detect life-threatening things such as landmines and cancer. Canines can help protect people from danger before the danger is even discovered. It doesn't even have to be about saving lives. Canines can simply improve the lives of people by finding something you lost. It doesn't matter if the task is big or small, as long as it can be solved using the olfactory system, canines can help. The diagram shown compares the number of odorants that animals and humans can respond to. In most cases, people can detect more odorants than humans and animals. However, canines are able to detect two times more odorants than humans can. That is the largest ratio on the diagram. No other animal can detect two times the amount that humans can. Did you know that in addition to cancer, canines can also detect malaria and Parkinson's disease? There have also been several tests to see if canines can detect COVID-19. If I were to continue researching this topic or conduct an experiment, I would test to see what other diseases canines are capable of detecting with only their smell, especially the terminal types that scientists have not yet already tested. This could help people discover disease early before it spreads to the whole body. This concludes presentation. In, in summary, canines have an exceptional sense of smell, far exceeding humans and other animals. Canines can be used to help detect different diseases and save lives. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. So, Sean, the question is, are there any specific breed that has the best olfactory sense? Uh, right now, um, they're using or the, the breed that has the best olfactory sense would be the ones used in 
police departments and military. Those would be such as the Bloodhound. Yeah. Okay, great job. And then I see Noelle's hand. Noelle, can you unmute and ask? Um, how do dogs detect cancer? That's a good question, but I don't have the answer to that right now. But I'd be happy to conduct more research and get back to you. Ms. Yamashita, did you have a question? Yeah, um, Sean, dogs are also used, um, you know, to detect people that are having a seizure. Are they, when, when that happens, are they using their olfactory senses uh, because is it because people are emitting a certain smell or even when they're, um, you know, when they're having a seizure? Sorry, Ms. Yamashita, I'm just repeating your question to Sean, so I'm going to give him some processing time. Hold on. Uh, right now, I don't have an answer to that, but I can conduct more research and get back to you. Thank you. You're all spectacular questions, and I thank you, Sean, for the hard work, uh, very apparent that went into this. We now are going to transition to uh, Reese, um, and he's going to do his presentation next. Good morning. My name is Reese Kawamura, and I will be presenting about improving distance and accuracy in football. When first told by my teacher to think of a topic, I was stuck between doing something with computers or something practical. Of the two, I chose something practical and went with football. The scientific merit of this project is the physics and kinesthetics of a football throw. This topic is important to me because I enjoy football, and since I'm not the best at it, I decided that I want to do research around improving my throwing abilities. Findings. In my research and experimentation, I found that with enough practice that is consistent and of good quality, you can improve. I also found that to throw the perfect spiral, the quarterback must release it at the perfect moment for it to stay on trajectory and land in the receiver's hands. It spins and turns over while in the air, which is due to something known as gyros gyroscopic precession. Precession is the motion of the axis of a spinning object when an external force is acting on the axis. The experiment was done within two weeks, and I took results before, after one week, and after two weeks. I followed a procedure that I would follow every day to get better. The procedure was to do 100 push-ups and practice throwing form, and lastly pass to the friend while focusing on quality. In the experiment, there were some errors which affected the results. Some errors include being inconsistent with practice, the time of day, then practice throwing form, and lastly pass with a friend while focusing on quality. In the experiment, there were some errors which had affected the results. Some errors include being inconsistent with practice, the time of day, not have anyone to pass to, limited space as it was done in my backyard, and the bad mentality during the test. The lack of practice led to less repetition and caused me to not show a significant improvement in performance. Here are four graphs that showed my improvement over two weeks. Three of them show accuracy and one of them showed distance. After week one, there was a 7% increase in accuracy, but not an improvement in distance as I threw 21 meters. After week two, there was only a 3% increase in accuracy, but a two meter increase in distance. During this week, I was a bit inconsistent with the procedure. and did not practice every day, which is why I did not really improve. Overall, I went up 10% in accuracy. and I was able to throw two meters farther, which means with enough practice and strength training, you can get better. The next step would be to translate what was learned to other skills in football, such as kicking or running. From this experiment, it can be translated to other sports like soccer, track and field, basketball, and more. PE teachers or even trainers could use a similar training method to the one I did to be able to improve at throwing or another skill. Specific facilities can be developed to help people improve certain aspects of their game as well. Uh, these are my citations. Uh, any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Yamashita. Um, Reese, I, I, I'm sorry, but was it only strength training that you were doing, or were you doing any other kinds of drills on this? Uh, I also did uh, like form drills that that I would do when in the procedure to uh, with a friend and. Yeah, it wasn't just strength training. And your form, your form drills. Um, how did you start with those drills? Did you like break it down and then gradually um, do it faster, or 
I, I want to know your procedure for with the form drills. Do you know what, you know what I, I'm talking about? Is like you know, there's a, a certain form that you want to do to throw. To, so did you break it down in steps or? Oh uh, yeah, I did. I okay. I did drills on my for like upper part of my body, like for the arm motion, and uh -huh. then also for the leg motion. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, would holding the ball a specific way uh, affect how far you can throw it or like change the trajectory? If you hold the ball a specific way, does it affect how far it can go? Hold the football and you're palming it, then your thumb might make make it like wobble and it won't go as far. Reese, great job. Oh, Miss Hugh, did you have a question? Yes, thanks. Um, Reese. If you were to apply this type of experiment with practice to music, how would you just design um, design the experiment to apply to see if practice could improve your skill in music? That's a good question, but I don't think I have. I don't think I can think of an answer right now. Okay, why don't you think about it a little bit more? Maybe we can talk about it another time. Okay, I will. Spectacular work, everybody. Um, okay, my name is Casey Chun. My name is Taren Urasaki. We will be talking to you about the effects of technology on our eyes. Today, we have been using our devices nonstop since the beginning of the pandemic. Most of us have been meeting with teleconferencing apps such as Zoom, WebEx, and Teams to communicate with each other. After school and work, we still use our devices for downtime or lunch break. Even though our screens are beneficial to our lives, it is and for our eyes. Therefore, we want to research about how it affects our eyes. So let's go. Topics. Here's some of the topics that we have found in our research on how technology can affect our eyes. Blue light. Blue light is one of the many lights in the visible light spectrum and is emitted from almost all screen devices. It produces a wavelength of 415 to 440, 455 nanometers. The shorter the wavelength means more amounts of energy are produced. Blue light has a short wavelength meaning higher amounts of energy. This energy damages our tissues and other parts in our eyes since we look at blue light every day with technology. Blue light damages. Blue light from our technologies can cause all three of these things. Macular degeneration normally happens as you get older, but blue light can make it come sooner. This can cause loss of central vision and in rare cases, total vision loss. Retinal damage. The blue light can affect this important tissue in our eyes and is most likely to cause total vision loss. Normally, as we get older, this will happen to us, but like macular degeneration, blue light will cause this. Blue light can also cause computer vision syndrome to occur. Also known as digital eye strain are vision problems that are caused by excessive use of digital devices. Blue light is a common factor of CVS because of its strong wavelengths and has been proven to increase the risk of macular degeneration. All blue light passes through the eye straight into the back of our retina, which are millions of light cells and nerves, which are damaged and destroyed from macular degeneration. Symptoms of CVS. Because of blue light damaging your eyesight, it leads to multiple symptoms throughout the face and head. Based off of our research, we found that blurred vision was the most common symptom we had found from respondents. You can see that blue light, or sorry, blurry vision is the most common because computer can put a strain on our eyes. The lack of definition in the letters, diminished levels of contrast, and much more can cause this blurriness. Next, headache and the redness of eyes were tied for the most second most common symptom, and finally, eye fatigue was third. All these symptoms may be true, but it could be inaccurate. In our error analysis, we found that some of these symptoms are common in everyday life. For example, a headache could have occurred from sinuses during testing, but not from digital eye strain. Posture. Posture plays an important role when looking at our devices every day. Most of us, like Taryn and I, always slouch in our chairs, thinking it's the most comfortable that way. Actually, bad posture and screens too close to our faces, your desk or keyboard being flat and not your convenience. Finally, your screen should be at least 20 to 28 inches away from the eyes, making it less vulnerable to blue light. Next steps. In the future, we think that anti-glare and anti-blue light screens could be beneficial to our eyes. Research has shown that glare could hurt our eyes because our eyes are trying to adapt to the brighter and darker parts of our screen constantly. In addition, blue light can cause many things to our eyes. With these screens, maybe we could prevent any further damage. Adjustable computer stands and posture chairs with the perfect angle could help you see your screen better and could decrease the amount of glare and eye strain. These two products could save our retinas and save us from macular degeneration. 
These are our citations. Thank, Thank you, you for watching. watching. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, ladies. Uh, are there any questions from our audience? Go ahead, Mr. Yamashita. I have a student with a question. Go ahead. What is the percentage of people that actually have this affected on them? That's a great question, but let me get back to you on that. Sorry, I have another student. Go ahead, Kevin. How do you think we will make anti-blue light screens in the future. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Repeat the question, what, what did you say? How do you think we will make anti-blue light screens in the future? That's a great question. We will get back to you on that one too. Thank you. That's all from 6B. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for your hard work on that. We're gonna be moving over to Sky Moore and Bryson Motes. My name is Bryson. And my name is Skylin. Our project is on the effects of toilet paper on the septic system. Can clogging toilets or using too much toilet paper harm the septic system? We wanted to know whether septic systems are still effective in getting rid of waste. It is important to know if toilet paper and other materials will deteriorate your system so that scientists know if rural areas need support as the world gets more advanced. The conventional septic system is mostly used in isolated areas without the common sewage system. The purpose of this is to dispose of wastewater and other objects after being drained or flushed. This is the structure of a conventional septic system. First, the clean water is collected from a well to the left of the image and leaves the house as waste. The septic tank is where it is organized and the drain field disposes of the remaining water into the soil, which then funnels back down into the groundwater. In the septic tank, there are three layers, scum, wastewater, and sludge. Scum is, some, is substances that are lighter than water, like oil and grease. This layer floats onto the top of the water surface in the tank. Wastewater is the water that exits your house and later exits your septic system. The sludge is denser than water and sinks to the bottom of your septic tank. The manhole on the roof, on the roof of the tank is for people to go inside and clean it out. The tank needs to be cleaned every three to five years. Sewage systems are commonly used in urban cities or towns where you don't worry about where the waste goes since it always leads to the ocean. But with septic systems, the waste stays in your tank and, until it is cleared. Usually cleaning a tank can cost up to $900. We want to know whether septic systems are still effective in getting rid of waste. Since sewage systems are extremely expensive and big to construct, people from isolated or small locations will have to rely on using septic tanks to hold their waste. So it is important for people to know if using toilet paper will harm their septic tank. We found that toilet paper cannot harm your septic system unless you use an extremely unnecessary amount of toilet paper. But you shouldn't flush anything other than toilet paper down the toilet, or you could create damages inside the tank that would be expensive to fix. But you can use a special type of toilet paper that reduces the chances of clogging. Recycled toilet paper re contains fewer chemicals and also features short fibers that break apart easily so that you can avoid potential clogs. These are our citations. Any questions? I have a question, um, unless our audience has one. Um, of all the different fields of science, why did you even think of, of doing um, septic systems and toilet paper. Um, I, I don't know. It was, I just wanted to know that if people in rural areas don't have sewage systems, where do their waste go? Got it. I, you know, I like that, that, you know, the, that curiosity drove your research. Uh, Ms. Yamashita, you had a question? What are the brands of toilet paper that can be used for stuff like that called? We don't really have the answer, but, um, Usually, if you just like look for recycled toilet paper, you can find which ones. Um, question from Mr. Pond. Um, in your research, is the trend moving away from specific tanks? Um, well, there are some tanks that are bigger than the others, but um, yeah, in more urban cities, the um, the in urban cities, sewage systems are more popular, so yeah, and everybody's like, the earth is getting more populated. Okay, great job. Thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, Alexandria Muha. 
Hello, my name is Alexandria Miha, and today I'll be talking to you about osteoporosis. I'm sure you're probably wondering what osteoporosis is. It is a disease that helps slowly destroy your bone density that makes your bones small and weak. Resorption eats the bone and formation restores the bone. This at a normal rate helps kill old and dead parts of the bone to help make the bone altogether stronger. However, osteoporosis can cause more osteoclasts than osteoblasts can manage. There are many causes for osteoporosis, such as smoking, too much alcohol, poor family health, family history, and many more. To prevent this disease, try to have good health, don't smoke, try to limit your alcohol consumption to a minimum, and find small healthy habits to do on a regular basis. Sadly, there's no cure. However, there are many drugs that help prevent osteoporosis Many of them bind the osteoclasts or bind to their food to help keep them away from your bones. The length of this disease is for as long as you live. Uh, no one has really miraculously been cured from this disease as we know. Hopefully in our soon future, we may have a cure for this problem. If not, that's okay because we can improve on the problems we have with the medications. What is awesome is that the people have actually thought of this problem and tried solving it, like the many emergency buttons that people can wear so that if they do fall and there's no one around to help them, you press the button and somebody can't help you. Uh, this is so that people with osteoporosis don't have to live in fear of falling and getting hurt. This research helps those who have this problem know that they're being helped, that the world isn't really trying to hurt them. Research of this issue can help there to be more discoveries that help this problem or any other problems in the future. Some cool idea, some cool facts I found were that it was prone to women. Three in one women have osteoporosis. Over 80% of all fractures in people 50 and up are caused by osteoporosis. 28% of women and 37% of men who suffer a hip fracture will die within one year. Osteoporosis is not a disease. One in five men can have osteoporosis and you start to lose bone density around mid thirties. These are my citations. Thank you for your time or any questions. Uh, audience, are there any questions? If you can either sh uh, show your hand or um, I may ask something. Mr. Chang, it's Doc. I have a question here. Oops. Go ahead, Doc. Okay, sorry. Um, I want to know, other than medications prescribed by, let's say, your doctors, are there any other things that you could do to kind of either slow down or um, continue or to sustain your bone density for osteoporosis? like? Um, any kind of exercises you could do or things that might help you without medication. Thanks, uh, Mr. Yeah, Chang. Yeah, there's many um, different therapies you can go to to help strengthen your bones. There's also uh, like these drinks that help also strengthen your bone. Um, you can also continuously eat healthy, which will help uh, in general with your health and everything. Thank you so much for all of that. I think it's fascinating uh, when, I, when I listen to a young person be interested in something like this uh, and this field. So much money is going into treating illnesses. Imagine if you could be preventative of all of it. And I think that it just opens up opportunity for all of the young people pursuing you know, medical careers that if you can prevent stuff like osteoporosis, which unfortunately I think you know, many of us will be getting this. And I, you know, I look at that that age bracket and I'm in that age bracket, you know, so I would want to make sure that I have some sort of preventative kinds of things. Uh, Ms. Yamashita, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, how is, how is osteoporosis diagnosed? You know, aside from actually breaking your bones, um, is there, is there a, a way to diagnose it even before, you know, like at age 30, um, do they have a way of diagnosing whether you have osteoporosis or not, so that you can do some preventive measures? 
Um, they do. I'm not really certain about how the process works, but I do know that they have a way to find if you have osteoporosis. And, um, but it's usually, they usually don't use it. And many people uh, usually have a fracture or many fractures in the past before they actually view or try to use that test. And I think that's a main problem with this disease is that they don't really use that test more often than they should be using it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Williams, did you have a question? And then uh, Noel. Yes, we have a question in 6A. Um, if you have the osteoporosis, will it affect your walking? If so, would you need to use something to help you walk around? Uh, that depends. If you had a previous fracture that got out of hand, um, osteoporosis really doesn't affect your walking. It just makes your it just makes your bones weaker, so that if you do um, fall or your question again? problem does come, then you can um, then you might need mm -hmm. help. Uh, Noel, did your room have a question? Can you use growth hormones to stimulate growth in your bones so that you don't like loot, like you're fractured all the time? I don't have an answer for that right now. Go ahead, Doc, if you want to ask that question. I think Doc's question is, is it genetic and is there a genetic predisposition to the condition? It can be genetic. So like if your grandma has it, then you might have it. And yeah. Uh, thank you so thank you so much. Uh, we're going to be moving over to um, Riley and Dylan. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Riley and Dylan. Hi, good morning. My name is Riley Kabuyeda Kazmo. And I'm Dylan Nevis, and today we'll be explaining how much energy it takes to dribble a basketball. Riley and I both enjoy the game of basketball, so we wanted to discover more about our sport and share our research with everyone. However, we had a struggle to find a topic to research on. There were a variety of topics we could have chose from, but our Science teacher Mr. Chang proved a good point and explained that no matter what shoes we play in or what court we play on, we've been playing this sport for many years and tiny changes like this would not make a huge difference in our game. If you ask basketball players like us, they will tell you that there are three main fundamentals you must know to play the game. Shooting, passing, and dribbling. Today we will be going over the, the physics of dribbling. What is dribbling? Dribbling is the repeated action where a player continuously bounces the ball towards the floor. When dribbling, there are two types of energy involved, potential and kinetic. What is potential and kinetic energy, you may be asking? Potential energy is stored energy that depends upon the relative position of various parts of a system. An example of potential energy is when you are holding the ball at your waist and patiently waiting. Kinetic energy is a form of energy that an object or a particle has by reason of its motion. For example, when you bounce the ball and it makes contact with the ground. As you can see in this example when dribbling, the basketball will start in your hands inactive and will drop to the floor. When the ball is still in your hands, that is considered potential energy. But when the ball is dropped to the floor, the potential energy then converts itself to kinetic energy. These are our citations. Any questions? Uh, great job, ladies. Uh, audience, any questions in regards to this particular project? Does the amount of pressure in a ball affect how much it bounces? Um, the amount of air in the ball does affect how much it bounces because like take for example if there's more air in the ball then the ball will bounce higher than if you have no air because then it'll just like lay on the ground 
I just want to continue to express accolades for all of our athletes that um, really kind of broke down their particular sports. Super proud of that. Um, science doesn't have to just be growing something or it doesn't have to be exploding something in a lab. It can be useful uh, in every day. So thank you so much. Um, great job, ladies. At this time, we're going to be going over to uh, Jordan and Kyra. Good morning. My name is Tyra Ho'olu. My name is Jordan Keiko of Vienna, and today we are going to be talking about how smell can affect the olfactory bulb. We both had an interest in working on a science project that includes how smell and the brain works, because there are things that we need in our everyday lives to function. We had gotten together and agreed that researching how the olfactory bulb works would be the most interesting topic to do for our science fair project. This was important to us because when we walk around our neighborhoods with a friend, or by ourselves, and we smell something, it throws away our trail of thought and what we're going to see. The olfactory bulb is a round mass of tissue that contains several types of nerve cells that are involved in the sense of smell. If you didn't know, the olfactory bulb is related to the part of the nose. The olfactory bulb isn't in the brain, but there is a connection to it that travels from the bulb to the brain. The scientific importance about this project was how the olfactory bulb which is in front of the brain, sends information to other areas of the body's central command for further processing. During the duration of our project, we learned many things about the olfactory bulb and other parts of the inside of the nose as well. One of the many interesting things that we learned was that there are two different olfactory bulbs on the bottom side of the brain, one above each nasal cavity. A key thing that we learned was that smell does in fact affect your brain and your thinking. Our findings were that, the, were that smell affects the olfactory bulb inside of your nose, and it can also affect other parts of your body as well. Say, those with full olfactory function may be able to think of smell that evokes memory. An example is, the scent of an or orchard in blossom happen spontaneously with the smell acting as a trigger in recalling a long forgotten event or experience. The top graph shows the sniff airflow. This shows what side of the nose can smell certain things that affect the olfactory bulb more than the other. It also shows the correct identification and the correct look identification. In the bottom, in the bottom graph, it shows the inside of the olfactory system. The olfactory system is responsible for our sense of smell. This sense, also, also known as olfaction, is one of our five main senses and involves the detection and identification of molecules in the air. Once detected by the sensory organs, nerve signals are sent to the brain where the signals are processed. We believe that the next step for the future of olfactory system is olfactory technology. It is a technology to sense, transmit, and receive scent-enabled digital media. These are citations that we use for our project. Um, are there any questions? Go ahead, Ms. Yamashita. Can like special and different smells like affect your olfactory bulb um yeah um in our research we found that it could because it can bring back certain smells can bring um certain memories to your brain i'm super impressed with your next step um mainly because can you imagine if instagram or facebook were to put in the smell feature and you could take the picture of the spaghetti and then it could come across you know or you have a picture of some cookies of grandma made and it's that particular smell that could evoke that kind of, you know, if you could get that, spectacular. Um, thank you so much for your hard work. Any other questions from our audience? Great job. So now we move it over to Wyatt, Jace, and Micah. Good morning. My name is Wyatt Kawamura, and my partners are Micah Tanganan and Jace Asalto. And we are all from the class of AD. All of us love the game of basketball. Today, my partners and I are going to be talking about how we researched and experimented with how shooting drills have an effect on a person's shooting percentage. The reason why we decided to choose this topic was because we really wanted to find out whether doing a specific set of drills would increase our shooting percentage. This topic of research has much scientific importance because proven right, it can help anyone if they do the drills and over time increase shooting percentage. Players looking to get better at shooting can use our research and experiment. They do not need to just use the drills that we had, but as well as pretty much any other basketball drill out there. Just doing it won't give promising results. Players need to give time and effort 
and there will be a major noticeable increase in shooting percentage. We found that pretty much any drill will help you with your basketball shooting percentage. One-handed shooting from close. The one-handed shooting drill will help you only use your shooting hand instead of your guide hand. A lot of players use their guide hand, which could lead to their shot missing left or right. Another drill would be to do close shots. This will help enhance your technique, rhythm, and your confidence. Some of our materials for this project were a basketball, basketball hoop, a laptop to write down data, and an area to shoot. The procedure to our experiment was to first grab socks and outdoor shoes and put them on. Next, get a basketball and go to a nearby basketball court. If you have a basketball goal, then you could just go right outside. Third step is to get a laptop or paper to record your data. Fourth, do drills consisting of free throws, one-handed shots, one-legged shots, and off-the-dribble shots. Fifth, after, shoot 20 shots from the top of the three-point line. Take your time. It is not a rush. Sixth, take a break in between your reps. And lastly, record your data. This experiment was perfect, and we had many errors, like playing on different courts, using different balls, and shooting at different times. So these are a graph from our experiment. The first picture, from the, on the first picture, the data from this chart will show the shots that we made. These shots are out of 20 shots. For every time we did the drills, our jump shot percentage increased slightly. For the next picture, the data from this graph will show the progression of all our jump shots. It will show that after we did our drills, it increased. Before we did the drills, we had a low percentage, but after we did our drills, our percentage increased tremendously. And for our last picture, this graph will show everyone that our percentage increased after we did our drills. After we did our percent practice drills, our jump shot percentage went up a lot. These are our graphs from our research. This chart is a graph is a chart for, for junior player shots. These are out of 20 shots. This graph was is also um, about the juniors. It will show the data from the chart. This graph will show it from the seniors intensity. This is also out of 20 shots. This graph is showing the chart instead in a bar graph, which could be easier to read for certain people. The game of basketball widely revolves around shooting from anywhere around the court. For any of the young talent out there and around the world, they could take what we have done and use it for their own training, especially schools out there who may not have that many tools like coaches, basketball courts, or teammates to practice with. This could be one of the ways that they use to greatly improve their skill. And here are our citations. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Great job. Uh, audiences, are, are there any questions um, for this group of gentlemen? Uh, so my question to the three of you um, is going to be, you know, you found out a lot of different errors uh, that you had in your experimentation. Um, is there any wisdom to practice makes perfect? Um, and that's a very common saying, or would you say practice makes permanent? Uh, I would say that practice makes permanent because sometimes people will do the drills wrong or will practice something wrong, which would lead to them doing that in the game, which could also lead to them messing up more or not being used to what they're doing. Okay, great job. Anybody else with any other questions? Hey, gentlemen, thank you so much. We're going to be now heading it over, to, uh, handing it over to Haley and Siana. Hi, I'm Haley DeSanayka. And I'm Siana Moore. For our science project, we want to see how science can be used to solve world problems. Today, we'll be focusing on how bacteria could be an answer to clean up oil spills. So what is the importance of our project? After reading stories of the continuous cleanup efforts for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, we were inspired to find an answer on how to depollute oil spills faster and successfully. Oil spills are destructive and catastrophic to all forms of life. We felt our research was especially important to Oahu since it's an island surrounded by water and is home to many endangered native species. So, if an oil spill were to occur here, it would have devastating effects to our oceans, land, communities, and depleting native animals. 
The current solutions we have now to clean up oil spills do more harm than good. Although the current methods, such as dispersants, effectively break down oil, they do so at the expense of marine life and the environment. Through research, we found a possible answer to this problem, relying on tiny organisms, bacteria. After extensive research, we found 79 types of bacteria that have capabilities to grade oil. Today, we'll be focusing on only two bacteria, Coelia and Alcanivorex borecomensis. Alcanivorex borecomensis is a bacteria that degrades alkanes found in polluted water all over the world. Alkane is a saturated hydrocarbon found in crude oil and forms the layer of oil floating on the surface of the water. The other bacteria, bacteria Coelia, is more complex because it can degrade alkanes and BTEX. BTEX refers to benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, which are all naturally occurring chemical compounds found in crude oil. Based on our research, we chose Alcnevorix borecomensis as the best and most prosperous bacteria at degrading oil. We chose this bacteria because it's present in all oceans, is non-pathogenic, meaning it won't harm or cause disease to other organisms, and has a various range of enzymes that degrades almost anything found in oil. Now let's break down how bacteria degrades oil. The bacteria breaks down the petroleum to the processes of either bioremediation or biodegradation. Bioremediation is deliberately using living organisms like microbes or bacteria to consume or break down pollutants in order to clean up an area. Whereas biodegradation is a breakdown of organic matter by bacteria and fungi. In both methods, it begins when the oil and the hydrocarbons are released into the ocean. The bacteria soon forms and mineralizes the petroleum hydrocarbons into carbon dioxide and water. The process continues as more oil is released into the water until the leak is stopped. Our research did not end by finding a solution for this problem. Instead, it motivated us on how to take the next steps and take the project further. In the future, we would use this research to benefit our local communities and islands. Tiana and I would like to start a project involving cleaning up Oahu's polluted waters. This project involves using bacteria, like the ones previously mentioned, in large abundance to clean up polluted waters on the island. If we were to take our project globally, we'd like to see if hydrocarbon degrading bacteria could be an answer to clean up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a zone located in the Pacific Ocean between California and Hawaii, containing 1.1 to 3.6 trillion pieces of plastic. If this bacteria was released into a controlled section of the patch, that bacterium could break down the petroleum-based plastics and pollutants in the water. Therefore, over time, decreasing the size and amount of pollution and plastics. Overall, our research proved bacteria can be used to depollute waters for future oil spills and possibly be a solution to the worldwide crisis of pollution. These are our citations. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Okay, go ahead, Ms. Yamashita. Um, how fast can these bacteria break down the pollution in the ocean? That's a great question. As I said, there are 79 types of bacteria that can degrade oil, so it depends on what type of um, bacteria is present and the um, amount of oil being released into the ocean. Okay, ladies, I'm going to ask you a question now. Get ready. How, in your opinion, was it doing research that on a topic where all of your data, everything else was at the master's or PhD level when you read an article? For me, I found it sometimes difficult at some parts, but after like taking a step back and looking for it as a whole picture, after reading like different um, the descriptions and things, sometimes you'd have to reread it. But um, it was it was a good experience, I think, and it will help me in the future. Oh, okay. So for me, I think it was quite hard, but um, after I looked at different um, articles and I looked at terms that I was able to understand, I think I was able to understand it more decently. Yeah, I got a guilty confession here. Uh, when Haley and Siana would come to me for questions, I said, ladies, you guys are already way above my level in terms of what you're researching. I can barely even pronounce these bacteria that, that you're, you know, that you're looking into, but I appreciate the effort, um, the deep dive, and you did a spectacular job. Thank you so much. Today's Science Expo is about celebrating the learning that has gone on in our classrooms. And while our course is centered upon the life sciences, we have covered topics like robotics, design, and introductory medical sciences this school year. When our students were asked to come up with a scientific field to research, many of them struggled to find something that they would devote weeks to researching. What you see today is a culmination of their efforts. 
It was our goal as, as their eighth grade teachers to give them a little bit of technical writing, a little bit of research, a little bit of citing their sources, and a taste of presenting their findings with poise to a larger audience. It also provides us an exciting connection in preparation for our programs for our high school division. In a few short months, our eighth graders will be introduced to our Pathways program at Marino High School. These pathways include medical innovation, STEM, CAP aerospace, creative arts, and expression, and advanced learning. Today, we're so proud of our students and their devotion to the sciences, hoping that this generation of learners will have unique solutions to our world's problems and solutions to problems that don't yet exist. So without further ado, I welcome you to the third portion of our Science Expo. Uh, we will begin today uh, with CJ and Micah Matsuda. Hi, my name is CJ and my partner, Micah. We are from 8D and 8C, and we are doing the effect on video game addiction and the dopamine. Um, this isn't particularly important to us because we both play video games a lot during our free time, and we get addicted by video games when we play it for a very long time. Um, it affects your mental health sometimes when you get addicted. Try to get tired next day, or you might go la get lazy during school. So, you, so you're probably wondering what is the dopamine? Um, the dopamine is a type of neurotransmitter that makes your body kind of like get addicted to things because it's expecting a reward and um, it's a big part of ourselves to make us think and plan to do things. It makes us also feel very much pleasure when we do things. As parents and teachers, you probably know a lot about video games and kids' addictions to them. This can cause a lot of trouble because kids can have attitude to elders, um, staying up too late. They can also lose money. And these are bad things because these are like problems with these because the kids don't really know what they're doing because it's addicting. So we, we thought we could help these by doing our method of teaching. Um, this is caused by video giving instant feedback, making the brain receive pleasure. For some kids, ha they have some time having a um, tough time learning in certain subjects. Teachers should make um, the learning easier for the kids that are having a hard time. Like in like a video game, they should make diff different levels. When you start, it should be extremely easy. Then later on, when they get when their skills get better, they should move on to harder levels. Then at the end, they should make a test to see if if it worked out. Video games can be addicting. Video games can cause poor mental health and poor social skills. This is caused by pleasure in the brain, as I said. And our solution was to make a new type of learning that requires levels of difficulty based on the child's skill level. We are hoping the students can stay engaged in school and teachers should make their learning more engaging so that students can stay on task and keep working in class. Teachers should also make learning fun like how video games are fun. Parents know that kids always wanna play video games, but you shouldn't give your kid freedom to, of how long they should be playing video games. These it's are suggestions. Thank you, any questions? Great job, guys. Um, I know that there's a lot of, you know, interested people in when it comes to video game addiction. Um, if you could talk about something that you researched that probably riveted you in regards to video games and addiction. We both play video games a lot and I wanted to know, like, what causes this addiction and part of it makes the addiction kind of happen. To me, when I research, I want to figure out, like, also, what's the main cause and why we get addicted super fast. And we found out about the dopamine and the video instant feedback. Are there any next steps that you could think of that you want to share with our audience? Uh, where could you take this research? Like, for example, I know you spoke a lot about how teachers or educational systems could employ tactics of video games for engagement to keep the kids engaged, to keep them interested, to level up. Um, or could there be anything in terms of next steps uh, in terms of education or next steps in terms of addiction? No, not really. No, not really. Because I, I don't really know the answer to that question. I'll get back to you. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to be moving over to Zoe and Kelly.
Hi, my name is Callie. And my name is Zoe. And today we'll be talking about the effects of sleep on adolescents. We did this project because we wanted to find out how much sleep we need because as adolescents, we don't get the right amount of sleep. Since we don't get enough sleep, we wanted to learn and tell others why as adolescents we should. The scientific importance of sleep is that if adolescents don't get enough, then it causes a high risk of health issues, bad behavior, anxiety, and depression. Adolescents don't get enough sleep because of many reasons. For example, some have too much homework, they're on their tech, they're addicted to caffeine, or they eat something right before going to bed. Adolescents often lack sleep and it causes them to have a hard time with remembering things. For example, if there was a test in the morning, not getting a good night's rest can cause you to forget what you have learned. What it affects? Well, you may think that the lack of sleep doesn't affect you that much, but you're wrong. Lack of sleep affects your body both physically and mentally. This causes major issues. We found that the amount of sleep you get affects you. It affects your brain because you don't give your brain enough time to rest. And when you lack sleep you need, it causes sleep deprivation. Sleep affects our behavior because it gives us an attitude have or have mood swings. Sleep also affects your mind because it can cause you to not pay attention, have stress, or be confused about things. When sleep affects our body, it causes us to have major health issues. For example, lack of sleep can cause high blood pressure or heart disease. When doing this project, we wanted adolescents, parents, and teachers to know how much sleep we actually need to live a long, healthy life. So we found out some things to help with that. The most important things for kids and parents to do is to have a consistent sleep schedule because it helps your sleep stay on track, avoid coffee in the evenings, and get more physically active so you're more tired at night. Adolescents should get 8 to 10 hours of sleep as shown in the first graph. And in the second graph, you can see that adolescents don't get enough. Our findings led us to think about the future and what the next steps are. So we decided that the next steps is to make a device that lets out air and gives a calming sound. We decided to do this because it can calm the person down. And when that happens, it's easier for them to fall asleep. Here are our citations. Are there any questions? Great job, ladies. And it's such an important topic in regards to sleep. And I think that not enough, you know, Young people get enough sleep, so this was great. Uh, are any, any questions from the audience, any of the rooms that are watching, or any of the parents? Uh, I have a question. Uh, this is Ms. Slum from the high school co uh, college guidance department. And thank you so much um, for sharing about the your sleep project. So recognize that we're, uh, we're just reflecting on the amount of sleep you both receive, what might be things that you like to do to improve your own sleep habits? Uh, practice before we go home, and then that tires us out, so we have a good night's rest. Okay, great. Any other thoughts on, or any other ways, so, so both of you guys get sufficient sleep once you guys get home after practice? Yes. Got it, thank you. Anybody else with any other questions? Okay, great job. Great job. Uh, we're now gonna be moving to Killian and Xavier. Hi, my name is Xavier, and this is my partner, Killian. Hello. And we did an experiment about how to increase speed. We did this experiment because people love to exercise, and there's a bunch of people that want to increase speed for all different types of sports. The reason behind this speed increase is that your skeletal muscle fibers are being worked differently. You can train either speed or endurance fibers in your skeletal muscles. During sprints, fast twitch fibers enable big, powerful movements. The goal is to increase our speed when running short burst sprints like the 40 yard dash. We were doing specific workouts to help work the skeletal muscle fibers so it can strengthen. <clears throat> this will help us gain speed and run faster. Speed work such as tempo runs and other types of speed works can help you get faster over time. The studies and scientific significance that we found were that running daily and working your body and strengthening your muscles was the best way to increase speed. VO2 max is the maximum capacity of a person's body to transport and use oxygen during exercises. The amount of energy used during exercises is directly related to the amount of oxygen consumed because of the breakdown of glycogen and fat 
for energy requires oxygen. Oxygen consumption increases in a linear relationship to running speed. These are the benefits of increasing VO2. The heart can work more efficiently, allowing more intense workouts, improving performance in events, slashing personal best, and greater abilities to call upon a wider range of speeds. Here's our data, and as you can see the, for the first trial, we ran an average of 5 seconds. After the first month of training, we improved by 2 to 3 seconds and averaged about 4 seconds after. Our speed increased about 2 to 3 seconds. Workouts can help you to lengthen your stride, which allows you to run faster over distance. The results that we could <coughs> have different, oh, that we could get could have differed due to the errors we had like the time of day, how much sleep we got the night before, what we ate, and how much stretching we did before the run. We could have decreased these errors if we tested it in the same place and at the same time. These are our citations. Thank you, and any questions? Great job, gentlemen. Uh, audience, any questions for uh, Xavier and Killian? Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were presenting is, you know, you have all this great research, all this findings, in the, you know, in regards to, um, this particular thing. How do you motivate people to want to do something that a lot of people don't want to do, like run? Um, probably because, I mean, running is very good for your health and it gives you a lot of exercise and it's much easier than doing other sports like volleyball or some other sports that take more skill. Uh, I think that we can motivate people or how we motivated ourselves was looking into the mirror and seen how out of shape we were after COVID. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Anybody else have any questions for them? All right, great job. We're gonna be going uh, to Mandy Ho. Hi, my name is Mandy Ho. I'm in eighth grade, and today I'll be talking to you about liquid crystal displays, also known as LCDs. I was interested in researching LCDs because I was curious as to how the shows I watched got into my TV screen. LCD is a method of display that your TV uses to project images on screen, like LEDs or OLEDs. You may be wondering, how is an LCD built? LCDs all have one key component. These are called liquid crystals. Liquid crystals are mesophases. This means that at the same time, their molecular structure is both a liquid and a solid. This allows them to change their structure accordingly to what function they need to perform. To build an LCD, you would need a case to hold all the components together then a backlight that produces light to illuminate the layers. Next is the TFT, which stands for Thin Film Tracker. This helps to have a higher quality display on the screen. Following the TFT, there is the liquid crystal layer. In this layer, liquid crystals help to form an image by moving around after there is a certain voltage applied to it. Preceding the liquid crystals is a color filter that filters white light produced from the backlight. After the white light goes through the color filter, it passes through a polarized filter. Polarized filters help to get rid of any glare while still letting the majority of the light go through. Then the white light continues into the cover glass, which projects the final image. I performed an experiment to see if I could mimic the shape of liquid crystals in the displays. My hypothesis was, if I put a string to modify the conditions inside the cup, then the crystals will grow differently opposed to the cup without a string. My hypothesis was right. This was because the string allowed different growth of the crystals just by simply being there. I observed throughout the span of a little more than two weeks that the crystals did not grow as fast as I thought they would. And over time, the crystals started to travel up the cup and grow there. As you can see, day one, there were almost no crystals. Day four, there were quite a lot, and we can see them start to grow on the side of the cup. The last photo, day 16, we can see that the salt almost took over the entire rim inside. In the future, I believe that in using the technology of LCDs, we can create something to advance the world of tech. According to research from the professors at Luxembourg University, they found that liquid crystals could change into liquid crystal shells. These shells selectively refract light. So when they are put in a pattern, it shows its design by refracting the light. The shells are reactive to certain external impacts, like heat, pressure, or specific chemicals. In the future, one possibility that is used could be in robotics, to allow the robots to enable a tactile feeling. The external impacts will act as sensors, which will enable that ability. 
Of course, liquid crystal shells could be used for many other things, and this was just one of the possibilities. This development could change technology forever and therefore also change the world. These are my citations. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Mandy. Great job. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Anyone um, that's listening to Mandy? Can you take us on the journey of how you selected this particular project? I know that you know you and I had talked uh, for a while about it, but do you want to share with the audience how you came up with your your topic idea? Um, I was just curious as to like how the TV worked, and then with further research, I found LCDs. Okay, great job, uh, excellent. Hello, my name is Tyler Hashimoto, and I'm Jan Yamashita. There are many options for our project, but we decided to choose how to increase pitching velocity. We chose to do it because we both play baseball and pitch. We both want to improve our pitching and velocity is one thing that we can get better at. Increasing velocity gives a batter a less time to see the pitch and react to it. For example, a 90 mile per hour pitch gets to the plate at the same time as the blink of an eye. This is some great batters that cannot, that struck out or didn't hit the ball from other pitchers because they just couldn't see it and or make contact. Adding even more speed to a pitch would make the pitch almost unhittable. The increase of pitching velocity changed the way of the game of baseball was played. And if we could develop faster velocity at our age, we could become great and better pitchers. Um, an exercise you could do to get better pitching velocity is pilo ball exercises. Some of the exercises could be marshals or reverse throws and much more. Pilo balls has been used by many MLB pitchers, such as Cyan winner 2021 Trevor Bauer. This is what participant one did, participant two did not. Participant two was a control. In our experiment, we wanted to see if plyo balls, if using plyo balls for four weeks would increase pitching velocity. The hypothesis to our experiment was that our pitching velocity would increase over the weeks. Our data and results were correct to our hypothesis. After four weeks, participant one's pitching velocity increased by four miles per hour. As you can see from the graph, participant one's velocity started at 68 miles per hour and finished at 72. This is participant two graph. He started at 65 and finished at 65. This was because he was the control of the experiment because we had practices every day and we wanted to see if practices affected our pitching velocity. This graph compares the different velocities between participant one and two. You can see that participant one's velocity increases while participant two stayed the same. Even though our experiment was good, there was a couple of errors that happened, such as um, participant one had workouts every other day while, per while participant two only had practices. Our experiment was successful. It matched our hypothesis, and over our participant one became a better and faster pitcher. His velocity increased in four weeks by a tremendous amount. The pilot ball drills could be highly effective if we used it correctly. There are many other fly balls. Fly balls are a good and reliable way to increase pitching velocity. In conclusion, this experiment we did was extremely useful. This is how to increase pitching velocity. These are our citations. And thank you for watching. Any questions? Thank you so much. Um, totally appreciate all of the hard work that went into it. Um, a question that I have is um, when you're, oh, sorry, Mr. Pan has a question. What exactly is a pilo ball drill? Please describe. Um, a pilo ball drill is when you use overweighted balls and you throw them as hard as you can to increase your throwing. It's kind of like lifting, but it increases your pitching. You're throwing um an overweight ball repetitive and each time you throw it, um, I guess you it's like what yeah, it's like like lifting. Okay, great. You know, I appreciate the error that you had described, mainly because a lot of young people uh may not have figured out that extra practice or anything else that they did could have increased their, you know, pitching, pitching velocity. velocity. So That's I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions from our audience? Go ahead, Xavier. Does the velocity that you pitch at? Um, yeah, it does. Compared to a fastball and a changeup, 
there can be like a 10 mile power difference between a fastball and a change. Okay, great job, gentlemen. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Aerodynamics affects your speed on a bike by Elizabeth Gillespie. Why I chose this topic. I chose this topic because I enjoy racing. I am always looking at ways to go faster and be more efficient. Knowing this information, you can see how aerodynamics affects your speed and what bike would be best to get the most speed. So what is aerodynamics? Aerodynamics is the way air moves around things. Anything that moves through air reacts to aerodynamics, such as a bike, a car, a plane, and even a rocket. How was the test performed? The test was performed on two separate days. On the first day, I rode the time trial bike, and on the second day, I rode the road bike. At the same place, I rode the time trial bike. For person two, I used data from Henderson, who performed his test in 2010. So for those of you that don't know um, about bikes, the one on the left is a road bike and the bike on the right is a time trial bike. The results. Yes, aerodynamics does affect your speed on a bike. In the research, we found that a time trial bike went at least 0.8 miles per hour faster, which saved you at least 11 seconds per mile. As you can see in the graph, both person one and person two have a higher MPH when riding the time trial bike. Next step, so knowing this knowledge, we can determine that with a smaller frontal area, the air moves around the bike more smoothly, which in turn makes you faster and more efficient. We know that the time trial bike is faster now, so it all depends on how competitive you are and how much the difference makes for you. These are my citations. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Elizabeth, thank you so much for your hard work. Uh, a question that I have is, can you tell the audience why this interested you and how you got to this point? Um, this interested me because I really enjoy racing and I'm always looking at ways to get faster. And I know aerodynamics plays a big role in how fast you can go because if wind is going at you, it slows you down and you can like feel it slow you down. And I wanted to figure out how I could go faster. Thank you so much. Today is the second and final day of our science expo. And we have already seen the wit, wisdom, and the wherewithal of all of our students. Yesterday's projects whet our appetites for sciences as the topics range from bacteria to olfactory senses. Today, we have spectacular projects lined up for you that hopefully will inspire students to continue to pursue science when they move on to our high school and eventually to college. What you see today is a culmination of all of their efforts. It was our goal as eighth grade teachers to give them a little bit of technical writing, a little bit of research, a little bit of citing their sources, and definitely a taste of presenting their findings with poise to a larger audience. It also provides us with an exciting connection in preparation for our programs in our high school division. In a few short months, our eighth graders will be introduced to our Pathways program at Marino High School. These pathways include medical innovation, STEM, CAP and aerospace, creative arts and expression, and advanced learning. Today, we are so proud of our students and their devotion to the sciences, hoping that this generation of learners will strive to solve the world's problems and to live our model of noblesse oblige, as they have been definitely given much. So much is expected. Without further ado, I welcome you to this year's Science Expo. Hi, my name is Daniel Lee. Welcome students, parents, and how your eyes and brain process optical illusions. I hope you have a fun time. Now, there are multiple types of optical illusions. Uh, some are optical illusions or auditory illusions. Today, we're going to be talking about optical illusions. Now, there are three types of uh, optical illusions. Literal illusions, which are literal illusions, they're usually made up of smaller images and are just that. They are made to confuse the viewer. Now, the second is uh, physi uh, physiological illusions, which are the types of illusions where if you stare too much, then it might have an effect on your vision or effect on any of the senses after being exposed to it. We won't be talking about that type today because some can be nauseating. And the third type is cognitive illusions. They're usually ambiguous illusions and uh, they're left up, up to interpretation and that's it. Now, what I found was that in a scientific study, 
by Professor Michael Bach and Dr. Charlotte M. Polachek. Uh, the eyes filter what you see, especially during illusions. So things like shadows, colors, and perception can help with cognitive illusions, like the ones that you see on screen right now. For the first image, you can see a skull, but it's also an imp interpretation of, uh, of a lady looking into a mirror. The second one, you can see two people standing, but it also looks like an old person. And in the third image, you can see three old people, but they're just uh, people listening to music. All of these factors can help into creating an illusion. Now, another finding is that perception is key. So when, when you look at something, a factor usually helps in uh, creating the, what you see as an illusion. For example, in the first image, you may see two photos. One is a woman looking in another direction, and uh, the second is an old lady with a giant nose and a cigarette smoking. Is it, uh, there, the factors can be switched upon uh, when you want. So when you want to look at the old lady, you can, look, you can see little factors like the nose or the eyelashes at the top. But when you want to see the old lady, you can uh, focus on the giant nose in the front. For the second illusion, you can see that you can see two faces. One is upside down and the other one is just normal. Now, this one is also uh, by factors where, uh, what? Uh, oh, something's wrong. Oh. In a scientific study, uh, once you flip it, the you can see two faces where you can see a person with a beard and a person with a hat. Uh, with the wrinkles in the head, you can see the nose, but when you flip it over, it also looks like a wrinkle. And on the top, you can see Elon Musk, where one image is upside down, where it looks like Elon Musk is smiling, but then once you flip it, now it looks like a weird image. This is because your brain is used to uh, coming to conclusions. So your brain thinks that Elon Musk is smiling because you're not used to looking at humans upside down. Now for an example for our experiment, this is the Muller liar illusion. This is a, an illusion that, um, this is an illusion that messes with your depth and how, how you see things. Now the illusion itself is, uh, there, are t uh, these, there are multiple lines with multiple arrowheads and these arrowheads can mess with your perception because all the lines are the same length but the arrowheads uh, uh, mess with your perception by making you think that it's different length so for the example on the side you can see that there are two different walls or corners of the walls and the, both of them are actually the same size but they look different because of how you're used to seeing depth now multiple illusions can be used in art just like uh, other types. Now for my data, th this data is uh, a scientific study where they change the illusion by uh, switching, not switching, altering the arrowheads by degrees and size. So as you can see, uh, mo more people can notice whether an illusion is uh, whether the illusion is false or all of them are even, all the lines are even, by altering uh, the arrowheads by size and degrees or angles, but the illusion can still be intact. So by that reasoning, you can uh, alter an illusion by uh, factors. So when you want to see one illusion, you can think of one part in your mind and then it will, sw it will switch. In the future, I want to continue research in all types of illusions, including uh, auditory illusions. Uh, more research equals more understanding. And like I showed earlier, uh, the illusions can be used in entertainment and art. For example, uh, most of the art I used back in the other slides, they are uh, from museums where it can be used to interpret uh, multiple parts of our world. Yeah. And you can also tell stories and entertain people. Here are my citations.
Any questions? Uh, yes, very excellent job, Daniel. Uh, my question is, how did you, how were you led to this particular field of research out of all the different sciences? Uh, I like searching up illusions. That's most, that's mostly it. Like I, I enjoy this part of research because when I was little, I got interested in illusions like real quick. So uh, I wasn't really interested in the most other types. Like I was going to research auditory illusions, but that's way more complicated. So I just chose this type. Because I, because you can also like switch between illusions by thinking about it. Like there's this one type where it's spinning, but it's also clear. So you can, uh, you don't know which way it's uh, going until in your mind you, you make up that decision. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, hey. Next, we have Jaden, um, who will be screen sharing and doing her particular presentation. Um, thank you so much for the question in the chat. Uh, we might be able to get back to it um, if we definitely have time. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jaden, and I'll be talking about the physics of Taekwondo. I was dedicated to karate for seven years, and even though it is a different martial art, I wanted to know how the most powerful technique, Taekwondo, works. Taekwondo is one of the most systematic and scientific traditional Korean martial arts that teaches more than physical fighting skills. It is a discipline that shows ways of enhancing our spirit and life through training our body and mind. The literal meaning of Taekwondo is Te equals or means kick, Guan means fist or fight, and Do means way or discipline. Taekwondo involves more, more kicking than karate. It puts a heavier emphasis on kicks and uses hands as backup. You will learn a variety of kicks, kick moves, including spin and jumping kicks. For karate, karate uses more hand attacks and your legs often stay grounded. Taekwondo uses a different leg stance because the body needs to be ready to perform fast kicks. Like any other sport, Taekwondo requires a lot of energy. The energy comes from three distinct energy systems in the body, the ATP, PC, lactic acid, and aerobic systems. ATP, PC system consists of adenosine triph triphosphate and phosphocreatine. ATP, PC is an anaerobic system which works during quick duration and high intensity movements. Lactic acid is an anaerob anaerobic system and it's the only system that uses oxygen as its prime source. The system releases on carbohydrates and the breakdown of glucose, which provides energy to ATP molecules to receive that. The aerobic system requires oxygen. The aerobic system produces large amounts of energy, even at the lowest intensity. The formula in order to get a lot of force in a sp specific technique is force equals mass times acceleration. In a test by National Geographic, Taekwondo was found to have the fastest and most powerful kicking technique at 220 kilometers an hour and approximately 2,300 pounds force. And according to a study by Colin Gavigan, the force of a roundhouse kick to a face was equivalent to a sledgehammer going to someone's body or face. When kicking, your power comes from your hips and your torque is produced by how quickly and how much you rotate your hips and foot to some extent. You can also apply Newton's three laws of gravity. When your leg isn't moving, then your leg will stay at rest until your muscles move it. When your leg is moving, then it will continue to move until friction between your leg and the target stops it. The more mass your leg has, the more force you would need in order to kick. And when you kick someone in sparring, you transmit power from your leg to your opponent, which makes them feel the power and fall back. You've then earned your point. A punch is at a distinct disadvantage from your roundhouse kick in terms of power. However, a roundhouse kick uses the entire lower leg for contact, while a punch makes contact with only one's hand. Whereas a leg might weigh 10% of someone's weight, and your fist would reasonably make up only 1%. But if you practice your strikes, you'll increase the speed of your punch by focusing on the extension of the punch in your shoulder and forearm. You can significantly increase the speed of your hand. The sheer speed of a punch can make up for its lack of mass behind it. Drills you can use in order to increase your punches are simply punching a punching bag continuously. Once you get this drill down, you'll start to notice that your punches are stronger and powerful. 
The importance, the importance of knowing the physics behind this art is because when you perform a strike or a kick, you do it correctly. If you don't perform the strike correctly or kick, you may injure yourself. The next steps of understanding the physics behind the art is later if others decide that you want to open up our school or just teach Taekwondo, they know how to teach the athletes in order to get more power behind a strike or a kick. The more power and force they have in a technique, the more likely they'll start to win more sparring matches. These are my citations. Any questions? Okay, spectacular job, Jaden. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if our audience has any questions. I know you had so many different types of martial arts that you were interested in. Uh, how come you decided to do Taekwondo? Um, Taekwondo has always interested me because I would always watch my friends um, at their practices and I wanted to know like how they get that much force behind the kick or like their sparring matches always interest me the most. You know, thank you so much. I really appreciate the practical application. Um, you know, we had so many students that wanted to do um, athletic things, whether it be, you know, throwing a football or, and so this is just a great example of how you can apply science even to martial arts or anything else that you would like to do. Thank you so much. Up next, we have Royce and Cooper Lee. Hello, my name is Cooper Lee, and my name is Royce Keo, and we decided to, to write about which paper decomposes the fastest. Tens of thousands of sheets of paper are printed every day, with half of them being wasted. Paper can also be wasted in soil, which is known as decomposition. Paper decomposition is hazardous because it pollutes the air by releasing nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and, and carbon dioxide. It's just as bad as greenhouse gases and acid rain. In this project, we wanted to see which paper decomposes the fastest. So for this experiment, we decided to use seven different types of paper, which are lime paper, white paper, paper towel, cardboard, construction paper, cardstock, and newspaper. And what we did is we cut them into two and a half inch by two and a half inch papers, and we placed them in flower pots filled with soil for three weeks. And during the three weeks, we water them every other day. And after the three weeks, we take them out and analyze the data. So here's basically what happened in all three trials. Starting with trial one, lime paper, paper towel, and white paper looks like they're the three to decompose the fastest out of the seven. Cardboard and construction paper were the ones to decompose the slowest as they only had minor color loss. And cardstock and newspaper had little rips and holes with color loss as well. So the only difference in trial two is that paper towel fully decomposed and in trial three, white paper fully decomposed. So our hypothesis stated that newspaper would decompose the fastest and we were proven wrong. Instead, it looks like paper towel or printer paper decomposed the quickest. An easy explanation to, to the de decomposition was mostly because of the fibers. A quick way to sum up fibers is thinner the paper, the weaker it is, and more vulnerable it is, the paper is to decomposing. The thicker the paper, the stronger it is. So there are three errors that happened in this experiment. The first one was the amount of water the pot received. Um, some pots received more water than others and water fastens the decomposition time. So that could have affected our data. The second one is the height the paper was placed in the pot. Um, some papers were placed higher than others and the water could have reached the paper faster and that could have fastened the decomposition time as well. And the third one is just us forgetting to water the pots some days. And yeah. Uh, our next step in this experiment is to try to create paper that doesn't decompose or just helps the community out in general. The first example is cotton paper. Cotton paper ha has substances that make it very strong and durable. Many countries use cotton material for legal documents so it doesn't decay in the future. The second example is a process called post-consumer waste. Post-consumer waste is paper made from paper items we throw away. We think, we think this process is best out of five because this process also keeps paper out of landfills and saves energy as well. The third example is another process called agripulp, which is basically the same thing as post-consumer waste, but instead uses agricultural waste to create paper. The fourth example is Kenaf paper. 
Paper made out of KNAF is, uses about 20% less energy than the regular energy used to make pulp. If you don't know, pulp is one of the things to make paper. The fifth and last example we use is bamboo paper, which which introduces which produces which produces five times more fiber than regular paper. So if it were to end up in landfills, it would take a long time for it to for it to fully decompose. Thanks for watching. Any questions? Gentlemen, outstanding. Uh, I was super impressed, especially with uh, error. Um, I think a lot of times we had mentioned this yesterday where people think that science, you know, projects always turn out perfect the first time, but we learn as much through our error. Uh, we have actually a question from our chat. Uh, is there a relationship between the, the rate of the compositions, uh, excuse me, decompositions and the type of paper? Um, can you repeat the question? Um, is there a relationship between the rate of the compositions and the type of paper? Um, yes, because some papers are thicker than others. Like, let's say cardboard, there's three layers with the outside being straight and the middle one being wavy. And that creates a thicker fiber, which makes it stronger. And compared to like line paper, line paper is very thin and the, its fibers are very weak and short. And um, short fibers could make the decomposition time faster as well. Thank you for that. Any other questions for these two gentlemen? Hey, awesome job. Thank you so very much. We now move on to Darian Pang. Hi, my name is Darian, and I'll be talking about plant propagation through stem cuttings. This is an important topic because plants are very important to us as humans since they provide us food and oxygen. Hi, my name is Darian Pang, and I'll be talking about plant propagation through stem cuttings. This is an important topic because plants are very important to us as humans since they produce food and oxygen. I did this project because if it does prove true, it could be used to increase the population of certain plant species. Also, it is a more cost-effective way to obtain certain plants. First, what is plant propagation? Well, plant propagation is the process of increasing the number of plants of a particular species. There are many different techniques of plant propagation. There is sexual propagation, which uses seeds, and asexual propagation like division, cuttings, grafting, layering, and tissue culture. My research question that guided my project was, is it possible to create a new plant out of an existing one without seeds? My hypothesis was that it was possible to create this new plant. So to test this, I conducted an experiment using basil. First, I took five cuttings from a basil plant and placed them in fresh water. While cutting, I use clean scissors and cut at an angle to allow optimal water intake. Then I let it sit in indirect sunlight until it started to gain roots. However, if the water got dirty, I changed it out to make sure that it had clean fresh water. After four days in fresh water, the cutting started to grow roots and and once they grow to about one or two inches, it could be planted in potting mix and grow on its own as an independent plant. The reason that plant propagation through stem cuttings can work is that when a cutting is taken from the host plant, auxins, which are chemicals stored inside of the stem, are sent down to the bottom of the cutting to create more root cells. With the information gathered in my research and experiment, I can use it to try to increase the population of endangered and special plant species. For example, if a species is on the brink of extinction and is about to go fully extinct, I can use this process of plant propagation through stem cuttings to try to up the population. For example, I could take a certain plant and keep on repeating the process by also maintaining a like by maintaining a balance by sending half of them back into the wild to reproduce and grow naturally. Also, if a plant has special features, I can use it to recreate more plants with that special feature since we know that the clones are usually exactly the same to the host plant. These are my citations and thank you for watching and is there any questions?
Darian, thank you so much for this uh, hard work on this particular topic. We have a question from Doc Silva's class. Do you know which plants in general are easier to propagate using stem cuttings than others? Well, usually if the stem is soft and not like hardwood, like trees, they would work better because it allows the roots to grow faster. And also not all plants um, can go through this process successfully. Okay, great job. Is there anybody else uh, that is watching that would like to ask Darian a question? Uh, from Mr. Ponce room, in your research, are there any actual plants that have been uh, through this particular process of cuttings from endangered to anything else? At this time, I do not have the answer for that question for that question. Okay, thank you so much. Um, spectacular job again. Uh, we now move on to uh, Luke and Evan. Hi, my name is Evan Tokumoto. And I am Luke Sagan. We are eighth graders of the class of 8B. Today, we will be talking to you about the reaction time of a baseball player versus a softball player. Our hypothesis for this project was that reaction time of a baseball player is faster than a softball player. Our topic is scientifically important to improve bad reaction times and create a better reaction time. Our topic is important to us because we both play baseball and plan to continue into our high school years. Findings. In our research, we found that our hypothesis was incorrect and that a softball player's reaction time is about 50% less than a baseball player's reaction time. So they have less time to react. This difference in reaction time comes from the distance of mound, the difference of mound distance as well as pitching speed. A softball mound is 43 feet away from home plate while a baseball mound is 60 feet away. Pitching speeds. While a baseball player can throw a baseball at speeds of over 80 miles per hour, a softball player will max out at about 75 miles per hour. This is due to the underhand pitching motion softball players use compared to the overhand baseball pitch. Data. Our data table shows the pitch conversion times of baseball pitchers and softball players. As shown in the graph, the softball player's speed is lower compared to a baseball player's speed. This is because a softball no, this is because a baseball player will have to throw 20 miles per hour faster than a softball just to have it reach the plate at the same time. Next steps. The next steps that could be taken are coaches and PE teachers using the idea of this topic for their members to increase the performance of their athletes. These are our citations and thank you for watching. At this time, we would like to ask questions you guys have. Answer questions. Okay, excellent job, gentlemen. Um, a question that I would have is what led you to this particular um, field of research? So um, we were led to this field of research because we both play baseball and we want to just keep playing the game. A question coming in from Mr. Pontero. Um Does the size or the weight of the ball matter? Uh, yes. See, as a softball is bigger and heavier, it's harder to throw than a baseball, which is about five ounces. Okay. Uh, a question from Mrs. Adair's room. Is there a difference with the speed uh, with the type of ball? A very good question, but at this time, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions from anybody that is in the presentation? Awesome job, gentlemen. We now move on to Noel and Sachi. Hi, I'm Sachi. Well, and the topic we researched was the effects of stardust on the world and what the universe would be like without if it was non-existent. We chose to research the stardust because space in general is a very mysterious topic with many aspects still to be discovered now and in the future. Nevertheless, my partner and I found interest in space and wanted to research it, later settling on the topic of stardust. This is important because I've been researching experimenting on all of the planet because due to the environment being way too cold. Many people are unsure of what exactly stardust is. In the simplest of ways, stardust is debris from space. Another term for stardust is cosmic dust. And it's a result of a supernova explosion. Before beginning any extensive research, we hypothesized that without stardust, the sun would not exist. And as a result, human and plant life would cease to exist and earth would be a giant ice wall floating in space. This is our data. The two diagrams on the top are, are showing the, the dust cycle, the 
the development of the dust cycle, which we, our analysis will go further more into detail. On the bottom is the formula for gravitational force of attraction, which is what all objects with mass has, and is what thus a dust cloud goes through when turning into a star in the last step of the dust cycle. If cosmic dust did not exist, it would have a significant impact on human life. Without cosmic dust, all stars would be gas, including the sun. Things like comets, asteroids, and planets would not exist. According to NASA science, the cycle first starts with powerful stellar wind, which brings pieces of dust into the cloud or a star exploding, pushing dust out into a dust cloud. The cloud collapses under its gravity, forming a dense core sustained by nuclear fusion. Then the dust continues to collapse into a star using its gravitational force of attraction. As the dust gets stronger, it shrinks in size, according to LASP Colorado 2007. Now the dust, um, now the sun uses the same process to transform into a giant red um, star the size of Mercury and Venus combined to sustain its energy. Also, dust absorbs both incoming radiation from the, from the sun and outgoing ra radiation from the Earth to keep the Earth's surface warm. According to Science Direct 2021, dust helps clouds form, and clouds reflect some parts of solar irradiance, the output of light energy from the sun's entire disk measured at the Earth, as stated by NASA in 2008, contributing to the climate of the Earth. So, with all this information, yes, cosmic dust or stardust is vital, and without it, we might be dead, proving our hypothesis correct. So, in conclusion, life would not exist the way it does now without stardust. The sun wouldn't exist, nor would organisms, and Earth wouldn't be able to support life. Because humans are because humans are unable to survive without stardust, scientists cannot be sure what life would be like without it. Every scientifically backed piece of evidence about humans shows that their existence and survival is traced back to the sun. The sun provides heat to preserve the human body and fuels the growth of food for sustenance. Without these variables, survival for humans would be scientifically impossible. In summary, stardust can be tracked back as what maintains life on Earth, as it is vital component of the sun, which sustains all known life. Without, without the existence or creation of stardust, not a single human being would exist that matches the biological makeup of humans on Earth. These are our citations. Thank you for watching. Any questions? Uh, the first question comes from Mrs. DePont from would the earth overheat if there were too much dust? Um, scientists, scientists can't exactly be sure because again, that's not exact. That's not how the sun works, but hypothetically, just based on research. Um, yes, the sun. The sun size and or the amount of stardust trapping the heat and energy of the sun could cause the earth to overheat. Um, you know, this is such a humongous over my own head uh, as a science teacher's kind of topic. Uh, do you think that it opens up a field for both of you to potentially study in high school and college, or are you kind of done with space and stardust? What do you think? I mean, I, we, we both had an interest in space before, so possibly maybe. Yeah, there's a possibility that we'd study this in the future. Yeah. Spectacular, you know, I, um, the University of Hawaii and different other colleges, you know, around our state, you know, some of the cutting edge stuff is coming from Hawaii in regards to exploration and space. Um, so just wonderful opportunities that are here. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, this group of presenters? Okay, so fantastic job. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be moving on to Josh. Hello, my name is Joshua Thury and I'm a student AP. Today, I'm going to talk about the effects of histamine on the human body. Why did I choose my topic? I chose my topic because I have an interest in the medical field and I have a severe allergy driven by histamine. With my research, I want to learn more about why I and every other person who has allergies experience uncomfortable side effects from taking antihistamines. What is histamine? Histamine is an organic nitrogenous compound found in a great variety of living organisms. It is distributed widely, although evenly throughout the animal kingdom, and is present in many organisms, including plants, bacteria, and insect venom. Histamine's chemical formula is C5H9N3. Histamine is involved in local immune responses, as well as regulating physiological functions in the gut 
and acting as a neurotransmitter for the brain. Histamine negatively affects the lungs because when histamine is released in the lungs, it narrows the bronchial passageways causing breathing issues. The gut is another area negatively impacted by histamine. Histamine is one of the main regulators in the digestive system. One of the possible root causes of digestive challenges such as diarrhea and nausea, along with a host of other symptoms, can be caused by histamine intolerance. Histamine is a chemical that acts as a major mediator of the acute inflammatory responses. Some cells related to the immune response affected by histamine include the macrophages, dendritic cells, T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, and endothelial cells. These cells secrete and express histamine, which affects its maturation, activation, polarization, and effector functions leading to chronic inflammation. When people think of histamine, they would most likely think of a chemical that, inf that inflames the skin. This is because hives is a most common allergic reaction. Hives is a histamine-driven allergic reaction that gives itchy red bumps all over the body as a result of allergens hitting the mast cell. Histamine is not only the cause of some allergies, but also a neurotransmitter for some essential parts of the body, like the spinal cord. Histamine is particularly a monoamine transmitter. This means that, that the neurotransmitter is a compound having a single amine group in its molecule. The bloodstream is the first place in the body to be affected by, al by allergy-driven histamine. This is because when the mast cell releases the histamine, it goes to the bloodstream. This is much more important than many others because if histamine were not released into the bloodstream, some allergic reactions would not occur, such as the inflammation of the skin. Finally, we have the heart. Histamine affects the heart greatly because of it being a direct stimulator. There are two types of histamine present in the heart, H1 and H2 receptors. H2 receptors cause an increase in heart rate. H1 receptors mediate chronotropic effects and coronary vasoconstriction. How does histamine cause allergies? Histamine is not the first cause of allergies. In certain things like food, plants, and animals, there are allergens. When these allergens hit the mast cell, which is on screen now, it tricks the mast cell into thinking the allergen is a harmful substance. When this happens, the mast cell releases histamine into the body as a neurotransmitter. What is histamine intolerance? Histamine intolerance, also known as histaminosis, is somewhat of an overdose of dietary histamine in the human body. The intolerance is technically caused by the gradual accumulation of extracellular histamine due to an imbalance. Some of the symptoms include migraine headaches, digestive system issues like diarrhea, flushed skin, hives, eczema, congestion, and conjunctivitis. Next steps. If I were to continue my research on histamine, I would try to figure out the side effects of antihistamine and how to regulate the difference between histamine and antihistamine. This might benefit a lot of people with the same problem as me. Taking a certain type of antihistamine can create similar symptoms to regular allergies. If there were a different medication for the prevention of histamine-driven allergies without side effects, I think this will have a big impact on the lives of some people with uncomfortable lives due to allergies. Here are my citations. And thank you for watching. Any questions? Josh, what a great job. We have our first question from Doc Silva's class. If you were unable to take an antihistamine, how else could you control the presence of overhistamine in the body? Uh, at this moment, I don't have an answer for that, but so I'll get back to you. Okay. And then, Mr. Thayer, if you can have your student unmute and ask. Uh, the question, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the, the question was, what is the direct uh, how does the antihistamine a person takes directly impact on the histamine? In other words, what exactly does the antihistamine do to the histamines in the body? Oh, um, the antihistamine, um, it depends on actually what type of histamine or antihistamine there is, because there are many different types of medications. Like, for example, there's Claritin, Benadryl, and Zyrtec. Each have a different type of chemical, but... Uh, in this case, I'll talk about uh, Claritin, which is the most common. 
uh, Claritin contains a chemical called loratadine, which actually, when it enters the body, it blocks the H1 receptor, which is a type of histamine, which in turn stops like the symptoms from happening. Okay, thank you so much. Um, any other questions for Joshua? A spectacular job. I have a question for you. Do you think that you're interested- Everybody's sitting in the, tall, scoot me a chair then. Interested in the medical field or any sort of medical fields because of this? Uh, yeah, I mean, before I started this project, I was interested in Im immunology and like um, just the medical field in general. Thank you so much. Totally appreciate your hard work on this. We now move over to Micah Combs. My name is Micah Combs. I'm from AA, and my topic is how can you improve a goalie's. <clears throat> oh my gosh, a goalie's chances of blocking a shot. So I wanted to do this because I play soccer, and I thought it'd be interesting to learn about a goalie and stuff. So what skills do goalies need to have physically? They need to have a quick reaction time and explosive jumps which can really help to have good saves and good blocks. So why do goalies need these skills? In a professional game, 18 shots can be taken and they can reach up to 70 miles per hour. How can you gain these skills? So a goalie can do shooting drills where a friend or a trainer can just shoot at them from all types of the angles and stuff. And footwork drills where um, a goalie can move throughout the cones and then try to block the shot afterwards. And lifting and plyometrics. So what can weightlifting and plyometrics help with? They can help with an increased vertical, better explosive jumping, and a quicker reaction time, which can really help. Um, another thing that needs to be considered for goalies is positioning. So they need to be able to cut off all the angles of the near and the far post. So it's harder for the attacker to take a good shot. And the crosses for a goalie should be, um, they should be two thirds of the line to the back post to make it easier for the goalie to be ready. So who can use this information? Uh, Soccer goalies, goalie trainers, and coaches can all use this to train themselves or train players to be the best that they can be. This is my citations. Um, thank you for watching. Do you have any questions? Great job, Micah. I think a question that I have for you is, do you pick, play the position of goalie for back five? Oh, no. I, I usually play wing or midfield. I don't, I don't uh, play goalie. I you know, quite awesome to be able to, you know, use your research in a practical kind of sense. Um, would you like consider even like training younger students uh, as part of like a community service thing so that they can improve upon their goalie skills? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions for Micah? Okay, great job, Micah. We now are going to be turning it over to Heidi, um, who will be the last of the presenters for this particular group of students. Hi, my name is Heidi, and I'm going to be um, doing a presentation on perpetual motion of water. Today for my science expo, I'm going to be explaining how this works. Here's some background information about the perpetual motion of water and what and when it was invented. The first perpetual motion of water machine was made by Robert Fluid in the year of 1618. Robert Fluid made this machine while he was mistakenly thinking that energy was created or made by water going through or passing a mineral. Here's a Beverly clock and how it is similar to a perpetual motion of water machine. The Beverly clock is supposed to change different kinds of temperatures by running on the pressure of the atmosphere without using any different kinds of energy. What is the importance of a perpetual motion of water machine? The perpetual motion of water machine is important because it is something that can keep repeating without using energy and saving energy is good for the environment. 
How is a perpetual motion of water machine scientifically important? The sign the significance of a perpetual motion of water machine is that it doesn't use energy. The water uses the flow of gravity to work and it is supposed to go on in the same way. Something I found while doing this project that I thought was interesting. I know people can make this perpetual motion of water machine and learn about importance of making these kinds of projects that don't use energy. The materials I used were a funnel, tube, um, clear tape, wood, popsicle sticks, and a glue gun. The errors were that the pieces didn't stick together easily. Okay, great no, job. I'm gonna give yeah, I'm gonna give Heidi an opportunity to set up her machine. Um, she actually made it, so we're gonna try and see if she can share it on her particular screen sharing. I mean, uh, camera. Motion of water machine and then come up and go in there again, as opposed to repeat. Okay, spectacular. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, so a question that I have is, you know, when I asked Heidi to complete this, she had done a bunch of great uh, design and modeling kind of projects. And um, so how did you feel making it, Heidi? Um, it was hard because I didn't know what pieces I needed at first. And the, I had to, like, keep remaking it to get it right. Uh, spectacular job, Heidi. Thank you so much for the hard work and all of the students that you saw during this uh, first particular pod. Um, hi, my name is Zach from 8C, and this is my partner, Micah, from 8B. And the purpose of this project was to discover how rainbows were formed and the science behind them. And uh, we put together an iMovie to play for you guys. What is a rainbow? In our studies, we found that rainbows are an optical illusion created because of the process of light reflection and light refraction. Light reflection is when sun rays hit water droplets, projecting an optical illusion, or in a human's eyes, colors. A rainbow can form in seven different colors consisting of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Light refraction is what is the more fundamental process of a rainbow. Light refraction would mainly be described as the bend or curve of a rainbow. Light travels at different speeds, so it causes the light to hit the water droplets at different times, therefore creating a curve in the rainbow. Rainbows can form in 12 different forms. These forms include fog rows, blue rainbows, multiple rainbows, twinned or double rainbows, full circle rainbows, supernumerial rainbows, monochrome rainbows, primary rainbows, poly rainbows, secondary rainbows, and Alexander Dark Band rainbows. The rarest type of rainbows are usually double rainbows. Double rainbows are rainbows with two arcs that are visible. Rainbows are always formed in a full circle, but when we are down on land, you can only see half of it. If you were in a plane or a helicopter, you could possibly see a full circle rainbow. Rainbows usually form with a 42 degree angle to them due to the light refraction. But rainbows are not just light that passes through raindrops, they are also produced by wavelengths. For example, the different colors of the rainbow are made up of different wavelengths. Red having the most of 615 nanometers and violet having the least of about 400 nanometers. Our research question was how does light form into rainbows and our hypothesis was light undergoes reflection in order to form rainbows. Moving forward, we know and understand the makeup of rainbows, which could help us in the future if we want to do something regarding light. But why are rainbows important scientifically? Rainbows are one of nature's examples of how light and reflection work, which would allow scientists in advancing their studies on things such as light and reflection. Um, yeah, that was our project. Um, do, are there any questions? Uh, gentlemen, good job. Uh, do we have any uh, questions for these presenters? Okay, excellent. Uh, we now move over to uh, Derek. Hi, my name is Derek Tolchin, and I am an EP, and I experimented resistors' effect on LEDs. The purpose of this experiment is to show the effect of resistors on the electrical current going into an LED. 
I want to understand how resistors work and how they alter voltage. So I decided to use the Raspberry Pi to run 3.3 volts through a resistor with different ohm values and see how it will affect the light emitted by an LED, light emitting diode. To do this, I'm using three different resistors in a simple circuit. 3.3 volts, volts will run through a general purpose input output pin, also known as GPIO pin, into a breadboard through a resistor directly into an LED. A hypothesis is that I believe that the 10 ohm resistor will work with the LED. For this experiment, I use three different resistors three LEDs, one Raspberry Pi, one breadboard, five jumper wires, one GPIO extension board, and one 40-pin cable. What is a resistor? Resistors are electronic components that resist the flow of electrons in a circuit. When I refer to resistors, I'm talking about the static ones that harvest excess energy. Resistors are either wire-wound wire or made of spirals of plug and play. Both serve the purpose of restricting energy. What is an LED and how does it work? LEDs or light emitting diodes are devices that allow current to flow in one direction but not the other, it's light. The diode is a negative to positive function that makes electricity flow from one side to the other with separate sides for positive electron holes and negative electrons in the gap in the middle. The gap in the middle is where electrons fall to electron holes which produce a photon that emits light. This process is known as electroluminescence. What is a Raspberry Pi? The Raspberry Pi is a small computer. The small computer itself is credit card size and runs on a 32 or 64 bit operating system. The Raspberry Pi's current OS, Raspbian, is 32 bit and runs on MicroPython or Python 3. The circuit for the Raspberry Pi uses 40 G uses the 40-pin GPIO cable and the extension board to connect to the Pi and to the breadboard. Once, once connected, I connected the jumper cables to the ground and GPIO pin 17 to the positive and negative lines of the breadboard. There, I connected the LED and resistor to positive. The resistor which worked the best with the LED was the 220-ohm resistor, not the 10-ohm resistor. Experiments show that the higher ohms for the resistor and meant the more resistance it has on the voltage. My prediction for this experiment is wrong. In fact, the 10 ohm resistor ended up burning out the LED when it kept it on for too long. And the 2000 ohm resistor made the LED be too dim to see. Here are my citations and any questions. Derek, great job on all of this. Uh, my question to you is, do you think that you are curious to pursue this particular line of, you know, computer building and or coding or testing in regards to this, or are you kind of done with it? Um, I'm definitely interested in going into this further, and I really thought this, that this experiment was fun, and I definitely want to try it again, but more complicated. Excellent job. Uh, any other questions from our audience or any other rooms that are watching for Derek? No other questions? Okay, if not, thank you so much, Derek, for your time and your definite effort on that. Uh, we're going to be handing it over to Lily. Aloha. My name is Lily and I'm in eighth grade in AP. Unfortunately, my partner Haley Bell will not be presenting with me. But together for this project, we had researched this topic to help us understand the world around us but more importantly, the stars around us in our solar system. So today I will be talking about how stars are different colors in space. But first, why stars? My partner and I have been fascinated by our solar system, though we knew so little about it. But finding our research about stars, at this time I will be presenting how stars are different colors. More importantly, how stars are indicators of temperature and how the temperature will affect the color of a star. Now this topic is important because without our stars, like the sun, we would not be alive today on Earth. In fact, astronomers didn't know that there were different colored stars until the 20th century. This explains that we have a lot to know about our solar system yet to be discovered. And as we had learned more about the different colored stars, we had gained a better understanding of what there is beyond our universe and its long history. 
So today I will be answering your question, how are stars different colors? Together, my partner and I had discovered that the temperature and wavelengths of stars give it a certain color. Now, as stars always give off light, this light produces a combination of different wavelengths. These wavelengths can change due to a star's temperature forming its different colors. At their highest temperature, stars appear blue, though at their coolest temperatures, they appear red. Now, as said, these colors may vary from a bluish white to even red in almost all shades of the rainbow. And over time, star colors may change because of the fuel they had burned. Depending on the temperature with its wavelengths combined, it may go either way on the color spectrum. As an example here today, this is a graph with the amount of light a star gives off at different wavelengths. Thus shown, a star becomes hotter as the light intensity pushes further towards the spectrum's blue end. And as over time, star colors will change eventually. Characteristics in stars vary in color depending on their chemical compositions, their respective sizes, and their temperatures. As a result of burning out the fuel, stars will eventually darken and become redder, while other stars will die and explode in space, would soon be more born and to come. For our next step further, we want to discover an organization that studies the stars of different colors in space. My partner and I would want a star station, station that analyzes more in depth about a star's lifespan and more of what the temperature can indicate for stars beyond space. As to conclude, stars are the future we have yet to learn in our solar system. And that is how stars are different colors in space. Here's my citations. Mahalo nui loa. Are there any further questions? Lily, I think you did such a great job. We have a question from Mrs. Yamashita's class. Hi. Um, it seems like astronomy is a passion of you and Haley's. Is that correct? Can you repeat the question again? Yeah, I understand. It, it seems like from this research, this research stems from um, the passion that you and um, Haley had of stars. Yes? Is that correct? Yes. We have a okay, passion. so, yeah, so it's a passion. And then, you know, for the future, you're saying about maybe doing a, a like a space lab there. What practical or why do you feel it would be important to study the stars more? Um, I, that's a good question. It would be important to study the stars because the stars have a big impact um, on Earth itself and the rest of our solar system. Okay, okay, so there is some importance um, for the stars that affect us? Yes, it affects us in many ways. In fact, okay. the sun is also a star, so without the sun, we wouldn't possibly be here today on Earth. Okay. Um, I just, and this is not even a question though, I, it, it's just a thought that I had and was wondering, um, so you don't have to answer, but because, you know, astronomy is a big thing and you have a passion for it and it seems like if this is a, a route that you want to go, does that affect what you feel about the projects on the, the telescopes on Mauna Kea. You know, as a young person, I would be interested, maybe on the side, not now, but to discuss with you your feelings of all of that, because you do have a passion for it. Um, and right now, there is no like space lab to study the stars, and we are studying it via telescopes like that. So I just wanted to plant that seed in your head. <laughs> And maybe we can have a discussion sometime. Thank you so much. That Thank was very you. Interesting. Uh, another question comes from Mrs. DuPont's room. Since the sun is a star, can it change colors? Um, yes, the stars can change color, but it all depends on the temperature in the solar system that affects or is around the sun in particular. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Lily? Okay, awesome. Thank you so very much. We are now going to be moving to Samantha. Hello, I'm Samantha. I'm an eighth grader hailing from classroom 8B. 
Today, I will be talking about mental health in middle schoolers. The purpose of this presentation is to make others more aware of what children could be dealing with in modern days. My prediction was that middle schoolers nowadays have more on their mind due to expectations. This was more of a guess, but I was right. I researched all the topics listed on the graph and included an extra disorder. It shocked me that there were more inflicted disorders than I expected. From the data, it can be concluded that kids do have more on their minds these days. Modern day children in middle school tend to deal with lots of different tasks, especially considering the recent pandemic and worldwide problems. Whether these challenges come from home, school, friends, or other environmental factors, they can overwhelm kids. It varies by person and comes down to outside influence and mental health, specifically disorders. The worst part is that these disorders could result in specific phobias and possible trauma. And these factors could result in extreme changes in behavior, such as sudden mood swings, inability to focus, and suicidal thoughts. Another way for these disorders to appear is through hereditary or accidental occurrences. I researched this topic alone to investigate some of these disorders and read through more articles to see what they could evolve into. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to talk about the disorders on the following graph. I'll also add in another that isn't on the graph. This is said graph. I'll break down some factors and talk about possible causes. Some of these disorders are quite controversial. The term PDD is used to refer to a group of disorders identified by delays in the development of socialization and communication skills. Symptoms include difficulty relating to people, unusual play with toys and other objects, struggles with changes in routine or familiar surroundings, and repetitive movements or behavior patterns. The best studied PDD is autism, and there are more examples of similar disorders. ADHD. This disorder is typically hereditary and usually stays with a child up to adulthood. Children could have trouble paying attention, controlling impulsive behaviors, or being overly active. People with this disorder usually don't grow out of it, and the symptoms can become severe to the point where they won't function in society. Anxiety. Anxiety is a common and normal occurrence. However, a chronic high level of anxiety may indicate that the patient has an anxiety disorder. A person with a generalized anxiety disorder experiences persistent and excessive anxiety slash worry that lasts at least six months. This is also the origin of phobias or things that people are really scared of. Another common disorder of this type is OCD. Depression. Depression is a common yet serious mood disorder. The symptoms are extremely severe, leading to affected emotions, thoughts, and struggle to, to perform daily activities. If it gets worse, then the patient could resort to unhealthy coping mechanisms. It could also evolve into thoughts of death and suicide. Panic disorder is described as a constant state of fear or paranoia. There's no definite cause for panic disorder and panic attacks, but there are some factors that cause it, such as genetics and major amounts of stress. Some examples of signs seen in a person about to experience a panic attack include rapid heart rate, chest pain, shaking slash trembling, shortness of breath, and dizziness. Bipolar. Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder that causes a person to experience intense mood swings. A person can experience three states of this disorder. The manic episode is known to show energetic and irritable behavior. The depressive episode is known to show indifferent and hopeless behavior. The mixed episode is the first two rolled into one. There are also different types based on how you experience specific episodes. For example, bipolar one, bipolar two, and cyclose and mixed. Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is also called DID or MPD. This is a brain MRI of a normal brain versus one affected by DID. There is no definite cause, but genetics and emotions could play a factor. It is also theorized that smoking a ton of cannabis and the traumatic experience could be causing it. Symptoms can include delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, trouble with thinking, and lack of motivation. Every one in three people who get schizophrenia are likely to fully recover from it. Dyslexia. This is otherwise known as reading disorder, and it affects the way a person can read. They can see the words like normal people, but their brains can't, can't process the words as fast. And the words could end up getting slightly scrambled. There is no cure for dyslexia, but enough support, the patients can become outstanding people. PDD is before the rest. ADHD begins in the middle of PDD and ends afterwards. There is a split that's around the seven to eight year mark, so nothing new affects it. Around the eight year mark, anxiety makes an appearance and ends at the 15 year mark. 
Depression starts overlapping anxiety at the 11 year mark. Panic occurs at the same time as depression, but starts at the 16 year mark. Bipolar and schizophrenia start more towards the finish and end around the 26 year mark. The graph is titled Many of the Mental Disorders Begin at the Exact Time Youth is in or entering junior high, high school, or university. And it isn't focused on specifically middle school. The information also isn't entirely accurate. Some kids could experience schizophrenia earlier in life, and a university student could be showing signs of depression after they graduate. The information below the chart could be proven wrong because some of it's updated. The analysis of bipolar and schizophrenia could also be off because both passed the 25 year mark and there is nothing to get a better estimate. As you can see, children at this age tend to go unnoticed with these disorders and it's hurting them a lot. I haven't even mentioned somatoform, substance abuse, and eating disorders, and those are also common. While many of the disorders listed above are said to be caused by genetics, they aren't always caused by bad genetics. Take depression as an example. Theoretically, it could be hereditary, but it could be caused by peer pressure, bullying, and FOMO. It can also be caused through abuse and neglection. You can be harming a child by not paying enough attention to them or making fun of them. If enough of this happens, then kids will start to believe it and see themselves the way others say they are. Many people accidentally misclassify or misunderstand how these disorders work. Schizophrenia is one on this list used a ton in movies to depict some crazy people, but that's not how it works a lot of times. Another reason for your child to be distant is sometimes due to sexuality. Lots of kids fear coming out to their parents, and it's fully understandable. I've heard stories online about their parents disowning them for not being straight. This topic you really don't want to rush because in high school, college, and middle school, bullies may use the victim's sexuality to humiliate them. And don't really assume things either. That makes things worse. I understand many parents want to help their children. I advise that berating will likely make the problem worse. The most common method is to take your child to a therapist and hope for the best. But if your kid trusts you enough to tell you, don't rush it. Let them explain it on their own, whether it's problems at school or a sexuality crisis. And as life goes on, scientists will start learning more about the human brain and could find a solution to prevent these. These are my citations. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Sam, I appreciate all the, the hard work that went into this. I know that this is a very, um, when you and I sat down, it was a very controversial kind of thing in regards to all the different mental health um, issues that, that young people are going through. And I really, really appreciate your hard work. We now transition over to uh, Justin Yamada, who will be presenting. Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Yamada, and I will be talking to you guys about gene editing and CRISPR. So what is CRISPR? Clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, or CRISPR, is a molecular tool used to edit genes. How it works is CRISPR consists of two key molecules. One is a piece of ribonucleic acid, or RNA. RNA are similar to DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid, but with only one strand and has some other things like a sugar deoxyribose and a nucleobase. The piece of RNA is called guide RNA or GERNA, which consists of a small piece of pre-designed RNA located within a large, longer RNA scaffold. The other is an enzyme called CAS9, which acts as a molecular scissors that can cut the two strands of DNA at a specific location in the genome so that bits of DNA can be added or removed. So this is how it works, if you can see the picture. A RNA scaffold binds to DNA and the sequence Okay, so um, so this is how it works. If you can see the picture, the RNA scaffold binds to DNA, and the sequence guides CS9 to the right part of the genome, which makes sure that the CS9 enzyme cuts the right point. And once it's cut, scientists can basically use DNA repairing machinery to change one or more genes to the genome. So using this, scientists can alter the DNA of animals. So you're probably thinking, why am I talking about CRISPR? Well, hospitals need a constant supply of organs to be used in emergency transplants, which they don't have. About 17 people die each day waiting for an organ transplant. So how can we get more organs for hospitals? The answer is pigs. Research shows pigs have all the same thoracic and abdominal organs as humans with some minor differences. This means with CRISPR, we can theoretically modify pig organs to use for humans. 
Here's a diagram of how it would work. Induced pluripotent stem cells or IPS cells are derived from skin or blood cells that have been reprogrammed back into an embryonic like pluripotent state that enables the development of an unlimited source of any type of human cell needed for therapeutic purposes. So basically you take the IPS cells of a human and inject it into clone pig embryos with an organogenesis disabled trait. Organogenesis is the series of organized integrated processes that transforms an amorphous cell mass of cells into a complete organ in a developing embryo. Then the human organ is generated in the pig body and it can be transplanted into patients. So this means that xenotransplantation or the process of transplanting between members of different species is possible. Not only is it possible, but it has been successfully done. This man, his name is Dave Bennett. A few months ago on January 7th, 2022, this 57 year old man with terminal heart disease was the first person to ever receive a genetically modified human organ. Although he died two months later, on March 8th, 2022, this was a truly important breakthrough as something like this has never been done before. So now xenotransplantation is no longer a work of fiction and hopefully very soon xenotransplantation would have a much higher rate of success and uh, hospitals would never have to worry about organ donors again. So what's next? Well, scientists can do more research to make other animals compatible to humans too. So if one day, if pigs ever go extinct, we can still use similar methods. And scientists should also try make the organs more compatible with the human body and lessen any possible side effects as the current patient only lived for two months before dying. Another important research could be to use CRISPR to give humans immunity or become more resistant to COVID-19. Overall, it can help hospitals save millions of lives, so it's definitely worth government funding and additional research. I hope after listening to my presentation, some of you fellow students consider becoming genetic engineers and use CRISPR to benefit the world. These are my citations, and thank you for watching. So, any questions? Just an excellent job. I just want to tell you how proud I am of your particular work um, and your research in this particular field. Thank you very much. Um, I know the question is, are pigs the only animals that could be used? Um, we're going to reserve that question uh, for Justin to answer later. I'm going to be actually be turning it over to Keanu. Hi, my name is Keanu, and I researched about how to increase your shot form accuracy. For my project, I'm trying to find ways how to increase my shooting accuracy. I chose this project because I wanted this wanted to experiment how I could increase my shot percentage and compete with the good teams. I felt that I could increase my shot through my shooting percentage and technique. The two things to do in, to increase your shot form accuracy is to bend your knees and have your elbow tucked under the basket. Having your knees bent can help in a lot of ways like balance, more power in the shot, and having more range. Having your elbow in can help in a lot of ways like control and helps your shot to become straighter when it releases. The in independent variable is my form. The dependent variable is my shooting percentage before I fix my shot. The control is shooting with muscle mesmer. The materials I needed for this project was a basketball court, paper, pencil, or pen, camera, calculator if needed, and a basketball. For my procedure, you take some warm-up shots by shooting three shots from each corner, four shots at the top of the key, so it makes it 10 in total. After you warm up, take after you warm up, take some shots for your data. Then repeat the warm up steps. After you're done shooting the first trial, look and see what you need to fix in your shot form. Lastly, record another trial with your fixed shot form. Then compare both the first trial with the second trial. The percentage of my shot went up after I added the correct spin and bending my knees. Before I fixed my spin and bending my knees, I made seven out of ten shots from the three point line. Then once I fixed everything, my shot average went up to eight out of 10 shots in the three point line. This is a graph of my control, trial one, trial two, and trial three. Another graph, but it's a pie graph. The main idea of this experiment was to see if changing your shot form will increase it. I went off of muscle memory and changing your shot form. This is helpful to people who are trying to improve their shot. I can encourage people to try this experiment because it is helpful. These are my citations. Thank you. Is there any questions? Yeah, Gunnar, thank you so much for your work on that. Are there any questions from any of the classrooms for Keanu? Uh, 
while we wait for any of those questions, Ken, I just appreciate the fact that you made this science practical. You know, it could have been any sort of field, but you picked something that was very useful specifically to you as a basketball player. And I think that I speak for the whole community when we say we look forward to, you know, playing for our varsity team here at Marinol. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you on that. We're going to be handing it over to Dylan Yamamura. My name is Dylan Yamamura, and my research is on the physics of a football hit. I want to find what goes into a hit and how much force the players can create. I also did this because I have always been interested in football. The importance of this is the things that go into it. Mass and acceleration go into force and how hard the players can hit. This can be important to a football, football fans because they can know how hard the players can hit. Um, acceleration is a big part of football. Acceleration basically means the ability to gain speed in a short amount of time. And it can be used in any position, but it could be used to create a big hit. For example, when a player is running the opposite direction as the ball carrier, and it wants to create a big hit, it will accelerate towards them. Many players also accelerate right before they collide with their opponent to, to maintain their max speed. Mass is the weight of the player, and this will help because the more weight you can hit your opponent with, the more likely it will be a hard hit on your opponent. So force is basically how hard you hit the opponent, and it is made by combine, combining mass and acceleration. When you have size and can run fast, you will be able to make a big hit. This is evident from a player like Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis was able to make big hits because of his size and speed. This chart shows three hard hitters from the history of the NFL. It shows here that Morris Badro could hit with 4.9 tons of force with a helmet hit and Haloti Nada could hit with 8.4 tons of force without a helmet, or with a helmet hit. These are my citations and, thank you. and any questions. Um, Dylan, I'm so impressed with the work that went into it. I know um, this was a very difficult kind of thing at first to try to get you inspired to do it, but I want to say it looks great. Can you kind of respond to me a little bit about how you integrated a lot of the math as well as a science into your project? Um, well, I just like um, found what goes into the hit or the force of it and just like um, put it into the presentation. Okay, great. Uh, it, would this make you more interested in um, the science of the football hit in the future? Or is the subject over for you? Uh, I think, I don't, I don't really know at this point, but I might, might continue it. Excellent job. Um, we're going to be turning it over to Keegan O'Grady. Uh, hi, my name is Keegan. And for my science expo, I'll be talking about the composition of Jupiter. I did this project because I've always had an interest in planets and Jupiter has always been an iconic one because of its size and ring. So I thought it'd be cool to find out what it is made of, whether it can sustain life and what the planet's like. Some basic facts of Jupiter. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system and it has a lot of storms, which makes it unable to sustain life. It also has rings like Saturn, but these rings are on the planet instead of on the outside of it. It also has the second most moons in the solar system behind Saturn. One of the moons may be, a, may be able to sustain life. It is also the oldest planet. And the giant red spot is a big raging storm made of clouds and other gases and is the fifth planet from the sun. When I started this project, I already knew some things about Jupiter. I already knew it couldn't sustain life, so that helped me with my hypothesis. I thought it was made of gases and dirt. What is the composition of Jupiter? Jupiter consists of clouds, gaseous hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, and metallic hydrogen. It also has a core, but the composition of the core is still unknown to this day. But most scientists think it is made of hydrogen, so my hypothesis was partially right. How are Jupiter storms formed? They are caused by convection. Convection is the process by which hotter air expands and rises to higher, colder, and denser altitudes. Another storm is the giant red spot. The giant red spot is a big storm on Jupiter that has been getting bigger for years now and is bigger than Earth. How was Jupiter formed? Jupiter used gravity to pull the excess gas and hydrogen from the sun to form itself. That's why the composition is very similar to the sun and why it is the biggest planet in the solar system. This is what Jupiter may have looked like when it was using the sun's gases to form itself by using gravity. How to find the composition of a planet? How to find out the composition of a planet or a star? Scientists use a system called spectroscopy. This system uses instruments that use grading, 
that spreads the light from an object to a wavelength. Then these wavelengths pick up fingerprints, and different fingerprints mean different elements. Basically, the system uses wavelengths to capture elements from far away. This is what the spectroscopy of a planet might look like. I couldn't find a detailed review on it, but that, that's basically an overview. Next steps. Maybe the next step is to create a robot that can actually descend into Jupiter. This could be helpful to collect samples of the gases just to confirm what we already know, or maybe to find out what the core is made of. These are my citations, and are there any questions? Uh, Keegan, great job on that. I'm going to give the audience some time uh, to process if there are any questions. If not, I have one for you. Questions for this presenter. Uh, Ms. Yamashita's class, if you want to unmute and ask your question for Keegan. Hi, Keegan. Um, how long would it, if we were to send a robot to Jupiter, how long would it take us to get it there? Uh, around five to six years. Oh, so if you kept up with this, it's possible that you could be on that team that created something. Possibly. Uh, possibly. Possibly. That's great. It's really good, Keegan. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from our chat. It says, what is the average temperature on Jupiter? Um, I think it's really cold. So around like negative 80 Celsius or Fahrenheit. I don't know the measuring temperature though. Like what system it's in. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question to you is, you know, a lot of the research that, you know, we had shown you in class, was so well above our level in regards to even the kinds of things we study in eighth grade or even high school. How did you deal with that high level technical knowledge that might be potentially at the PhD or even like master's level? How did you even parse through like that kind of information? Uh, I don't know. I don't really what you know what you mean by that. Like you, you know, the that. articles that we had read about space. Uh, the ones that you had used were they all written in regular, you know. Um, eighth grade science language, or did you ever encounter uh, um, a journal article or um, research that was above level? Um, most of them were at my level because they were just like overviews by NASA, none were written by like PhDs or anything like that. Okay, great. Up next, we have Richard Tom. Good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Tom, and today I'll be presenting the emotional cognition between canines and in this study that I conducted research, in this study, I conducted research on how dogs react to the emotional, emotional changes of humans through their facial expressions and physical actions. Emotional cognition is the ability to interpret the emotions and behaviors of others. And in this case, it is the dog interpreting, interpreting the human's emotions. The emotional expression of a dog and a human will be judged on a scale of one through seven based on the physical reactions. The purpose of this research was to prove that my new dog can indeed figure out my emotions. Unfortunately, I, I was not able to do an experiment, but however, I gathered information and data to prove that dogs can indeed read your feelings through your face. This project also provides interest and awareness in dogs' behaviors around different types of people, whether it be threatening or pleasant. Uh, according to a recent experiment conducted by Mir Mia Maria Kujala, it is evident in the graph shown that humans and dogs have similar reactions around, around threatening or pleasant people. Despite, despite a pug's notorious smile, it is one of the best species to handle stress and it'll help you deal with difficulties. The Labrador Retriever is also ranked among the top dog breeds because of his intelligence, peaceful temperament, and gentleness. In conclusion to what is being researched, the capabilities of a dog and the sense of, com sense of communication that it could have with humans. Your own dog could sit in your lap when you are feeling happy or sad and provide comfort when it is needed. The benefits of the dog is that children's physical and mental health will be greatly improved by having a pet 
and can sense their emotions as, a, as it is a coping mechanism for someone who is feeling depressed. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Are there any questions? Richard, thank you so much for your work on this. As the rooms are asking their uh, class for any questions, my question to you is, I know that you really wanted to do this particular experiment. Do you think that over the summer you might want to conduct it with your brand new dog? Um, yes, I think it'll be a fun experiment because my dog's a little on the naughty side and I think it'll provide good information for the type of breed because my dog personally is a Chihuahua Terrier and Terriers are also one of the most intelligent dogs. Okay, we have a question from HC in the chat. Uh, why is it that the pug is a top coping dog? Because of its notorious smile. And when someone looks at a pug, it's kind of like warming, welcoming, because of its like round smile. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Richard? Okay, Richard, thank you so much. We're going to hand it over to Rush. Uh, how's it, everybody? My name is Rush Kamake Aina, and today... I'll be explaining a couple of exercises that can help improve and increase your running speed. Uh, you might ask, why did I choose to research on how I can increase my speed? Well, in the beginning, I had a hard time on which topic and what topic I should select. So I went with what I was good at, which is sports. Nothing seemed to interest me on researching for sports, so I thought I should write on what I needed to help on or what I can improve on. I also chose this topic not only so it could help me, but so it could help other people who are wanting to increase their speed so they could get the help they are needed. We can start off with what is speed. Speed is the rate at which someone or something can move or operate at. When running, speed is determined by seconds and minutes and hours. Speed is shown throughout our lives in many ways. For example, speed can be shown by a car moving, a track runner running, or how fast you throw an object. As you can see, this chart will show you six types of exercises. In the next few slides, I will be explaining a variety of exercises in these six topics. Endurance, aerobic, lactic threshold, and anaerobic. All the exercises to increase your speed is all strengthening because your, for speed, your muscles and joints need to get stronger for stability. The muscles targeted to increase your speed are usually quadriceps, hamstrings, quads, and calves. Uh, we'll go into endurance, but endurance can also tie in with like the sprinting exercises because like the pace and the exercises are all the same. So like endurance is the fact or power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult slide uh, process or situation without giving way. Uh, you might ask like, why do we have to do endurance training or like, what is it? And endurance training is running at an easy pace. So like you got to pace yourself throughout the ways. And some exercises that have to do with it is karaoke's, high knees, butt kicks, and lateral shuffles. Aerobic exercises is a physical activity that increases the heart rate and the body's use of oxygen. Some exercises like burpees, jump rope, jumping jacks, and squats will, can help boost your cardio and is a big effect on increasing your speed. The next uh, set of exercises we'll look at is lactic threshold. Lactic threshold is a very steady tempo run. This means in this workout, you will be doing long exercises. It is a phys physical activity that increases heart rate and use of oxygen. Some exercises like burpees, jump rope, jerks, and squats can help boost your cardio. All of these exercises, th lactic threshold is a of some running you can do 400 meter runs, 5K and 10K runs. So the most important thing is to be calm. You don't really need to be like running. So like you, the least you can do is jog. These are my citations. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Rush, for being so patient and for being able to uh, be flexible in regards to the tech uh, malfunctioning. Uh, my question to you is, you know, we, we work so hard uh, trying to come up with a topic. Do you think that you would be interested in devoting more of your time for like physical training? Would that be a potential career option? So like in, in terms of what you research, do you think that that's something that you would continue your research? I don't think I would continue it, actually. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else that you would be interested in continuing science-wise? Okay. Are there any questions for Rush from any of our um, audiences that are listening? Good morning. My name is Kansas. My name is Nia. 
Today our topic is about how anesthesia works. Anesthesia is important because without it, we wouldn't be able to have any life-saving procedures today. We wanted to do this topic at our science expo because we thought it would be good to know the process of going through anesthesia. The risk of anesthesia is that they can have sore throat, vomiting, damage to teeth, cuts on lips, tongue, gums, throat, and have nerve injuries. What is anesthesia? Anesthesia is a medical treatment that keeps you from feeling pain during medical procedures. General anesthesia affects the patient's whole body. When anesthesia is put into your body, you become unconscious. Surgeons use anesthesia during the surgery. Without anesthesia, most of the life-saving procedures such as open heart surgery, brain surgery, and organ transplants would not be able to occur. Doctors provide general anesthetics either into their bloodstream or patients inhale it as a gas. How does anesthesia work? Anesthesia temporarily blocks nervous system signals. The nervous system is made up of the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. Messages from the body travel through the nerves and spinal cord to the brain. Anesthesia blocks pain messages from getting to the brain. Anesthesiologists are medical doctors who give patients anesthetics. However, these specialists play a much wider role than just putting people to sleep. There are, they are also involved in a range of other medical procedures. They specialize in anesthesia care, pain management, and critical care medicines. Anesthesiologists evaluate, monitor, and supervise patient care during and after surgery. This image shows the anesthesia system. The image shows a workstation that supplies anesthesia gases and vapors to the patient. This station also provides a manual and mechanical ventilation system. This means the machine system provides fresh air for patients. These type of machines also offer protection devices and alarms designed to keep users and patients safe. The first image shows what a patient's heart rate looks like when they are not under anesthesia. And the second image shows what a heart rate under anesthesia would look like. The image shows that being under anesthesia will lower your heart rate and make you more relaxed as surgeons operate on you. Different types of anesthesia affects the hearts in different ways. In this figure, it shows the different types of anesthesia and how it works with the different types of medicine for the correct body type. For instance, the general part of anesthesia works on the whole type of body when going through surgery. The local part and nerve block part would do the same as general, but would do its part as you can see by the picture showing. According to the research that we have done, anesthesia works when it is needed going through big surgeries or certain kind of testing that you shouldn't have to feel the pain. During the surgery, the doctor will keep an eye on you and make sure that you're okay and that your vital signs are steady. Also that your cells are looking how they're supposed to if you didn't have anesthesia in you. This expo research was a successful and is good to know if you come across anything in the future. As the future of medicine starts to evolve, so will anesthesiology. Scientists studying the short and long-term effects of these drugs in specific groups of people, such as the elderly, children, and cancer survivors. These studies will reveal whether certain anesthetics are better than others for those certain groups of people. New technologies will be able to help doctors make anesthesia safer for patients to use. With more research, scientists hope to design anesthetics to be safer, more effective, and more personalized for patients. These are our citations. Thank you for watching. Any questions? Uh, ladies, excellent job. Um, we're going to give our room some time to see whether or not they have any questions. Uh, my question to you is, you know, in connecting with our social studies and language arts curriculum, um, and you're going to hear about the Civil War and about how they didn't have anesthesia, you know, back then. Do you think that we've come a long way from the Civil War time in regards to technology for anesthesia? Yes, I do because. Before they used to just put a towel in the person's mouth and now you can use either a gas or they inject it into your bloodstream. Um, and then to dovetail off of that particular comment, wh where do you think it's going to go next? Do you think that instead of even using gases that they might even like potentially like put an implant, you know, to start and stop, you know, pain receptors? What do you think the next step may be physiologically as opposed to drug based? Would there be anything? Um, that's a good question. We don't know. Um, do you think that this would inspire you to continue on in this field? I know two different presenters, uh, maybe Kansas first. Would you want to continue in the medical side or what do you think? Um, yeah, I think I would. 
in the beginning i wanted to be a surgeon but like after going through this science expo i think kind of shift shifted okay and nia um i wanted to be a pediatric anesthesiologist so yeah i think i would continue this this is outstanding. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions from our audience? Okay, ladies, again, excellent job on this. Uh, we now are going to turn it over to uh, Marcus. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus Naito, and I am a student in 8A. For my science fair project, I'm going to be reporting on the effects of satellite speed on orbits. Okay, so you're probably already wondering, why is this important, and why is this important to me? Well, I've always had an interest in space and humanity's endeavor to explore it and find out its secrets. And I wanted to know exactly how scientists figure out what the perfect velocity is for in order to get an orbit that is desired for their satellites. And satellites are very important. In fact, we use satellites every day. In this presentation, we're actually using satellites to beam information. And when you're, when you're using televisions, Satellites can beam information from the television's broadcaster down to your television and in GPS as well. There, I wanted to also see if there is a regular pattern for orbits between velocity and altitude. And if we could figure something out here, we can get an easier calculation for a satellite such as an equation to actually calculate velocity based on altitude and eccentricity of orbit. So my hypothesis was that the faster a satellite travels, the higher the orbit will be due to the added energy against the gravitational pull of Earth. So here are my results, velocity versus gravity. Velocity must be greater than the gravitational pull of Earth so that for an orbit. If it is much greater, then the object will be flung away from the Earth and it will orbit the Sun instead of the Earth because it has escaped the Earth's gravitational pull. However, if it is less, then the object will not be able to achieve an orbit and it will just fall right back down to Earth and crash into it. The Kepler curve is also a very interesting thing that I found about orbits. This Kepler curve basically shows a very routine pattern between orbits, velocity, and altitude. Now, but now this doesn't only apply to satellites. As you can see in this top right graph, this actually applies to all orbits. This is an orbit, this is a graph of the planets. As you can see, it follows this line based on velocity and its semi-major axis or its orbit, or its altitude, I'm sorry. And in this bottom left graph, I collected some data from different satellites and space stations that are currently in orbit. And as you can see, it also follows a very similar curve to the planets. And if you can see this little bunch up of dots at the top of the graph, that is what's called low Earth orbit. And that is where most satellites orbit, like, like space stations and stuff. And toward like the last dot here, that is what's called geostationary orbit, which is where velocity perfectly matches the rotational speed of Earth. And that allows the satellite to stay above one point on Earth. And this is what's used in GPS. When velocity reaches zero on this graph, you escape the Earth's gravitational pull. Interesting data. Okay, so in conclusion, the size of the orbit increases with velocity following the Kepler curve. This proves that my hypothesis was indeed correct, that the faster a satellite's velocity is, the higher and yeah, it is higher the orbit is. Orbital velocity does change with altitude and where the velocity required for an orbit will get smaller as you get higher up above the Earth because gravitational pull becomes less powerful. For next steps, we want to find out the application of the Kepler curve in other orbits such as for next steps, we're going to find out the application of the Kepler curve in other orbits, such as orbits of stars around their galaxy, and perhaps with, our, with natural satellites, such as our moon, in orbits of planets. I'd also like to find the equation of this Kepler curve so we can 
accurately graph velocity and altitude in a simple equation. So these are my citations here. And yeah, that's that concludes my presentation. Um, are there any questions you may have? Marcus, I want, just want to thank you. Uh, I apologize for that interruption. We, as you know, we're going live, so we had um, one of our PA announcements uh, looking for me in regards to that. So thank you, Marcus, for uh, being flexible in regards to that. Uh, my question to you is, you know, I always learn from every every time you speak, um, and I know how um, much work went into this particular science project. Um, if you had a choice to pursue a career. Would you pick something more along the sciences line or more along the social studies line? Um, I think I would pick social studies over science just because I find more interest in like world history more than science, although I would take either one if I had the okay. chance. Very good. Any other questions uh, for Marcus in regards to this? Um, we have a question from HC. Go ahead, unmute HC and see if there is a question. Okay. Uh, my question for for him is, is the altitude of a satellite for a GPS, like the one that we have on our phones, um, is it lower in terms of its orbit or its distance from the Earth than the, uh, the altitude, than the uh, satellite that would track, for example, a ballistic weapon being launched by a country? Um, that is a great question. Um, so GPS satellites orbit on what is the geostationary orbit now, this is very high up because it needs to perfectly match rotational speed. And that would actually be higher up than most satellites that would track missiles like NORAD satellites. So yeah, GPS satellites orbit higher than like missile trackers. Uh, great job. Any other questions for Marcus? Thank you so much, Marcus, for your patience and again, your flexibility. We're gonna be now moving over to Myra and Journey. So Myra, hold on while I give you presenter mode. Once again, thank you, Marcus. Whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Journey Han. And my name is Myra Pettit. We are from the homeroom 8B. The topic that we will be talking to you about is the hippocampus and its memorization on unfamiliar terms. We experimented with typing and handwriting to see which may be a more effective method for memorization. Going into this project, Journey and I were interested to explore the field of psychology. We have always struggled to find the best method to take our notes effectively whether to type or handwrite them. Our world becomes more and more digitalized as every year passes. Typing notes seems to be much easier, less cramping in your hands, everything stored in one place, no loose papers. But is it really more effective when it comes to retaining the information being given? Journey and I decided to test this theory ourselves. Our driving question for this experiment was, is recognition and memorization in the hippocampus more effective whilst handwriting unfamiliar terms as opposed to typing them. We hypothesized that handwriting would indeed be more effective in memorizing. Before we continue, we need to understand what the hippocampus is. Located in the inner region of the temporal lobe, the hippocampus plays a crucial role in learning and memory. The hippocampus is where both short-term and long-term memories are formed. Long-term memories are formed with repetition which is why we concluded that handwriting may be more effective. Handwriting incorporates shapes that we're very familiar with and uses the same motions repeatedly. Therefore, handwriting could potentially be more effective than typing. Similar studies have been conducted before and have shown results parallel to our hypothesis. According to a study by Lincoln in 2020, handwriting is more effective because it involves more sensory elements than typing. Sensory elements like sight, touch, and hearing are key components to learning and memorizing. Handwriting may include those such as seeing the letters, feeling the familiar strokes, and hearing the sound of the pen against paper. In 2020, Kendra Cherry explains that sensory helps develop long-term memory. Our experiment was comprised of two different tests, the handwritten and the typed. The participants were given 10 combinations of three letters, like shown in the green box, to write down. The participant is then given 30 seconds to memorize it the best they can. The type test was similar only in which the letters were typed and not handwritten. Once the 30 seconds was up, the as many combinations as they could. All four of these graphs have pink and green bars, which represent the amount of correctly recited combinations. As we take a look at these graphs, we see a pattern. The green bar, which represents the handwritten test, led to a more accurate outcome. 
shown on the screen is the average results of all three trials. Participant one had an average increase of one combination, while participant two had an average increase of two combinations. Once we conducted our experiment and analyzed the data, we came to the conclusion that our hypothesis was indeed correct. Handwriting is the more effective way of memorizing. Moving forward from here, perhaps it is better to steer away from a completely digitalized world. Teachers and professors can incorporate more handwritten notes and assignments and not require digital note taking. Another solution may be using new handwritten to text tablet technologies, which can be found on devices such as the Apple iPad. This way, you will still have the experience of handwriting, handwriting your notes, but when reviewing can be more legible. Here are our citations. This concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Please, ex uh, outstanding job. Uh, we're going to give our room some time to potentially come up with any questions, uh, but I do have a question for you. I know that you and you know our, your group had a lot of conversation about not when, when you actually tested um, the combinations. How important was it to keep it novel, um, meaning brand new every single time? Uh, and randomize it versus you seeing the same combination over and over. So we did have that problem and we originally thought that we would um, generate it ourselves, but we thought that would be inconsistent. And so we ended up using a generator for randomized letter online and we could like control how many like vowels and consonants are in it. So then, yeah, we ended up using one vowel per combination. So it was like completely randomized. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Mr. Pond, did you have a question? Because I know that you had always talked about um, handwriting notes versus typing notes. Uh, feel free to type in the chat or any of our sixth grade classes that are watching. Do you have any other questions? I know many of you are asking your students to take notes. Maybe uh, from this research, uh, you may ask them to handwrite it versus um, typing in their notes. Um, yes, Mr. Punt, go ahead. Oh, wait, no, sorry. From 8C, go ahead, unmute and ask. Jim Gloss, my question was for both of the students here. Which for you is the more effective way for memorizing? Is it handwriting or taking down notes on your laptop? For me, I think handwriting is more effective. Like, for example, if we're trying to memorize like algebra equations, when we handwrite them, it helps me retain it more for the test. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Dare, for that question. Um, if there are no further questions, I just would like to thank all of our presenters today, all of our guests that have logged in. I want to just um, extend our warmest thank you um, for devoting your time, taking out a time of your busy day to just see our students and the hard work that they put forth. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, eighth graders, for all of your hard work. Thank you to our eighth grade team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Take care, God bless, be safe, stay healthy.